Okay. Okay, I'm going to call the um, October 15, 2020 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Planning Commission to order. I'm sorry for the delay. Could we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Conway? Here. Commissioner Spellman? Mr. Spellman? <laughs> there he is. I'm here. I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Dawson? Here. Nielsen? Here. Greenberg? Here. Maxwell? <laughs> Chair Schifrin? Um, you need to unmute yourself, Sean. I I'm here. Well, you're unmuted for a second. Okay, there's uh, nobody absent with, uh, uh, are there any statements of disqualification? Seeing none, we'll go to oral communications. Uh, this is a time for, uh, excuse me, anyone to speak on an item that is not on tonight's agenda, but is uh, validly before the Planning Commission. Do we have anybody who wants to speak during oral communications? Uh, there are attendees in the queue. Any attendee who wishes to speak at oral communications, can you please press star nine so that I know you wish to address the commission? And then do they have to uh, push star six to speak? Uh, they'll be queued by Zoom. If okay. not everybody has that issue, most people are going to have it. And I don't see anybody raising their hand to address the commission at oral communications. Okay, I'm going to move on uh, unless uh, there's somebody who does want to still be heard. Seeing no one, let's move to the next item on the agenda, which is approval of the minutes. Uh, does anyone on the commission want to make a comment about the minutes? Seeing none, is there anybody in the audience uh, who's listening in who would like to comment on the minutes from October 1st? Seeing none, would somebody like to make a, or hearing none, somebody like to make a motion to approve the minutes? I move I'll make a motion. Uh, uh, Commissioner Spellman, will you second it? Sure, I'll second. Uh, motion by Commissioner Greenberg, second by Commissioner Spellman to uh, approve the minutes. Could we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Conway? Aye. Spellman? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Maxwell? Can't hear you. Um, did you call in, Sean? Hold on. He did nod his head in the affirmative. <laughs> I want to make sure that he can speak so that if he does want to say something later on, he's able to do so. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Okay. Must be my earbuds then. Did you want to register your vote? Aye. Thank you. Uh, Chair Schifrin. Aye. Okay, the minutes are approved unanimously. We now move on to public hearings. The first is the Santa Cruz Wolf Master Plan and Environmental Nation. And the way the process will follow is that we'll hear a staff report. Um, or reports will then have an opportunity for commissioners to ask questions, um, not make comments or statements, hopefully, and then we'll open it up to the public uh, for people to testify and then bring it back 
uh, to the commission for consideration and action. Uh, unless somebody would object to that approach, that's how we're going to do it. So can we start with a staff report? Dave, you're muted. Can you hear Dave? There we go. Yeah, I got you. All right, there we go. And uh, uh, you're also, your your notes pages are showing. I'm not sure if, if that's your intent. Uh, do you have two screens there? Yeah, we're supposed to go to the other screen, but there's no notes there. So um, let me put it on the full screen so it's easier to see. Sorry about that. this again. Is that better? No. Yes. Yes, no. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for having me this evening. Uh, my name is David McCormick. I'm the uh, Asset and Domestic Development Manager with Economic Development for the City of Santa Cruz. Uh, I oversee a, pretty much city-owned properties that are used in partnership with uh, private enterprise, nonprofits, um, and otherwise put to community use. Uh, so the uh, Santa Cruz Wharf Master Plan uh, began a bit before my time uh, in 2013 when the city acquired um, or secured a grant from the Economic Development Administration um, to, uh, to figure out a comprehensive plan for the wharf. Uh, that, was, uh, that grant was originally for rehabilitation work after the 2011 tsunami. Uh, but the Economic Development Administration uh, informed the city that uh, they needed a master plan uh, for any further funding, and so that's what they chose to fund uh, to move forward. Um, tonight, I want to just kind of give a, a little bit of a, a recap of the Historic Commission meeting last night uh, and the topics that they engaged, uh, and then dive into you know, why we have a master plan or why we've been developing one, uh, what the goals are, why it's needed, um, then into the details of the master plan as well as the EIR and uh, master plan design standards and uh, our policies and design guidelines. It should be policies and design standards section. Um, so as I mentioned, last night uh, we brought the Wharf Master Plan and EIR to the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, they were asked to evaluate the plan on its merits as regards um, historic resources of the wharf as well as um, some input on the design standards um, so that we can ensure that the goal of the master plan in bringing back more of the historical character of the wharf uh, is in line with the, the cultural and historic sensitivities uh, that the Historic Preservation Commission is charged with. Um, so under CEQA, uh, an impact to a, a historic uh, resource is considered a physical demolition, destruction, relocation, or alteration of a resource uh, such that it would no longer be uh, eligible for listing on the California Register of Historic Resources. So currently the wharf is eligible uh, under um, certain criteria on the California Register, as well as on our, uh, it's listed on our local historic building survey and may also be eligible under the National Register of Historic Places. Um, the California Register has identified seven aspects of integrity. Uh, this is what the Historic Preservation Commission was evaluating. And it's just a little bit of good background as we get into what the plan is and, and why it's important to protect this uh, community resource. Uh, so those aspects are location, uh, the setting that it's in um, and that it shapes, uh, its design integrity, uh, the materials that it's made from, its workmanship, the overall feeling of the place that relates to its uh, history, and its association with its historic past. The, um, what the commission uh, well, what the, the EIR and the historic reports that went into it found is that under the California Register, the wharf, uh, its, its character-defining features relate to its location, its setting, um, the location being that it has never moved. It's always been in that location. Uh, the setting and its relationship to the beach, uh, the end of Pacific Avenue, um, the Monterey Bay, uh, some of which has changed, but overall the wharf's relationship has been consistent. Um, also important is that uh, signature L shape where it bends at the end, uh, kind of into the oncoming waves. 
Uh, it's wooden material. Uh, the wharf is one of the longest wooden wharfs in the world, uh, certainly the longest on the Pacific coast and uh, likely the longest on uh, any coast of the United States uh, as far as wooden wharfs go. Uh, it's near its original length. Uh, it lost about 45 feet in the middle of the century in the 1960s when the uh, original warehouse building was taken down, uh, largely due to deterioration and, and neglect. Um, but most importantly out of all of this is that uh, its historic value is derived from its continued function as a wharf. Uh, and so that's really what we're talking about tonight is how the master plan will help us ensure the wharf continues to be a wharf and continue, continues to stand for generations to come. Uh, and it's you know, facing significant challenges in that regard. Uh, the master plan provides us opportunities to, to help ensure that it'll be sustainably run. As I mentioned, just an overview of the original wharf at the top. Um, that's what it looked like after it was built. Um, and that's what it looks like today. As you can see, there's been a number of expansions on the wharf, um, at least four or five, um, depending upon how you, you know, how discreet those individual um, expansions are. But uh, a number of times we'll revisit that later. Um, also important to the historical review that they conducted uh, was understanding that the period of significance for the war, um, the master plan relates it to its, its original role as related to the bay, the maritime and the commercial fishing that really transformed the Santa Cruz economy uh, and helped in its early economic development, making Santa Cruz what it is today. And so uh, from a historical perspective, it's that period that is really the target of, um, of sort of capturing its its uh, history, although having been there over 100 years, uh, it's got a lot of history to tap into and it will continue to build history as we go forward. Uh, and we're all part of that. Um, from its beginning, it's also important to note that it was uh, first overwhelmingly supported by the community of Santa Cruz. Uh, in 1913, when the bonds were voted on, over 95% of the community supported it. Um, and it was originally envisioned as a, as a commercial wharf uh, there to support commerce and economic development. Um, today, it's more of a recreational and tourist destination, but it still has a very important commercial uh, aspect. And we rely on those partnerships with local businesses to help keep the wharf standing and, and funding for the operations on the wharf. Uh, and lastly, it's, it's important to note that uh, within the wharf uh, historical analysis, those, those character-defining features relate specifically to the wharf structure itself. Um, the building, the contemporary elements above the wharf, the buildings, the decking, the roads, lighting and utilities, all of that is, uh, doesn't relate to its historical period of significance. Um, it's been created well after. Um, and so they don't have, a, they're non-contributing elements to its history. Um, doesn't mean they're not cherished or, or loved as they are, but they, they have a different standing under the CEQA and the historic preservation kind of rules. Um, given all of that, uh, the Historic Preservation Commission uh, approved a number of motions last night, um, really to, uh, to one, support the, the master plan and, and help it move forward with the staff recommendations that are uh, in your staff report tonight, um, together with a few alterations uh, that they felt would really help uh, improve the, our efforts to, to bring back that historical character and, and, and the feeling of the war as relates to it. Um, so first and foremost, uh, they recommended uh, that historic alteration permits heard by the HPC, or the Historic Preservation Commission, uh, be required for certain projects. Uh, they also looked at uh, having new buildings reviewed by a historical architect um, to see that they, they aligned with the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitation of historical features. Um, they also wanted to really emphasize that uh, with the proposed cultural buildings, uh, the landmark building, the gateway, the pavilion, and really anywhere else uh, that the opportunity presents itself, we should be looking to, to really convey that wharf history and, and ideally find a home for a wharf museum uh, that, that relates to that history and, and speaks to it. Um, and lastly, uh, they, they suggested remove, uh, reducing the overall height uh, of those landmark buildings to 35 feet uh, from staff's recommendation of 40, uh, and that 40 foot is, is consistent with the current zoning, which was established through its own public process in the general plan. So uh, they, they felt that going a little bit below that um, is warranted in this case. As I imagine, uh, we might hear some comments tonight. Um, a little more detail on that. So specifically as it relates to um, the historic alteration permits, uh, they wanted that the new cultural buildings, those three I just mentioned, 
as well as the entrance gate and any modifications to the wharf structure uh, should require an alteration permit. Um, I, I think there's, it, there's also, it, it appears um, that they may have also intended that to uh, relate to any buildings over 3,000 feet, which is in the second item. Um, but, you know, pending approval of the minutes at their next meeting, I, I think we'll clarify that. Um, but what they did also state is that any building over 3,000 feet should be reviewed by historic architects for consistency with those uh, rehabilitation standards I mentioned. Um, and, and again, the, the mention of the Wharf History Museum and then that reduction of the landmark building heights um, from 40 to 35 feet. Um, so that sums up the, the Historic Preservation Commission action on this item. And now we can kind of get into the, the Planning Commission to, uh, topics here. So first and foremost is, is why, are, why are we pursuing a master plan? Uh, what's wrong with the work and why do we need to, to do this? Uh, the first thing is, is that the, the 1998 Beach South of Laurel Comprehensive Plan, which um, outlined all development in the wharf and beach area, uh, called for objective standards for the wharf. We needed clear guidelines of what uh, new development should look like and how we can reinforce its, its character. Um, and we just don't have that. Um, the Coastal Commission likewise wanted updated regulatory and permitting framework. Um, sadly, the last plan we had for the wharf uh, was found in the 1980 beach area plan. Uh, so it's over, uh, and the design framework. Uh, it's over 40 years old now. Um, and when I show it to you in just a minute, you'll see how drastically different that plan is uh, than the work we have today, even though it did lead to some really, uh, really great improvements like the Commons area, the Agora, um, the buildings around those, like uh, where Alita's and Rainey's are now, or Bonnie's Gifts and Surf Life, uh, all those improvements came from that plan, um, but the vast majority of what's in that plan uh, was never, never developed um, because, you know, subsequent community process uh, changed the master plan. That's part of the process. Uh, and, and certainly what we expect would probably happen with this one as well, uh, supposing it gets approved. Uh, the next uh, item is the, uh, the Wharf Master Plan acknowledges that the Wharf has uh, a number of roles to play. Uh, it's a feature of historical significance. Uh, it's a community, a recreation community resource. It preserves habitat and open space values. And it's a real estate asset that uh, really sustains or works to sustain itself um, through the revenues it generates, as well as attracting visitors to the, the Wharf and Beach area. Um, and finally, like once again, the work match plan is a framework and guidance for what uh, new development should look like, but it doesn't prescribe what that development will be. It just creates opportunities for us to explore and, and develop as we go forward. Um, oh, and one more item is, is really uh, the critical piece here is that it's needed for any grant funding. Um, so we know the work has a lot of needs. Um, and for years, we have not been able to compete with other uh, agent cities and agencies uh, because generally uh, state and federal programs need approved environmental documents and master plans for competitive grant seeking, um, and we just don't have that. Uh, so here is that 1980 beach area plan. Uh, this is uh, the, what it called for the wharf to look like. Uh, as you can see, it's almost kind of like the uh, Pacific Garden Mall meets the wharf. Um, there's a lot of geometric shapes that kind of played out on the, the surroundings of it. Um, there's kind of a strange... T-shaped extension at the end of the wharf that was in that plan. Um, and while, you know, we have no intention of pursuing uh, anything under this plan at this point, we, we'd really like to move forward with the, the plan we're talking about tonight. Um, this is the framework we have to work from. 40 years old, and it doesn't fit the needs of, or the wants of the community today. Um, and it's not really sensitive to the historic uh, nature of the wharf. So getting into uh, more about the master plan, our, our ultimate goal is really about uh, creating a more sustainable work. Uh, that means balancing our social responsibility to the history and the culture and, uh, and public access around the wharf. It means uh, creating economic opportunities for, for businesses and our community, but also ensuring that the wharf is financially sustainable, that it's able to generate enough revenues to pay for itself. Uh, so that it doesn't continue to, to draw down on the general fund, uh, particularly in a time of crisis that we face today. Um, and then, of course, the, the wharf in many ways functions as a, uh, an artificial reef. Um, we know there are, are dozens and probably many, many more uh, different types of species that uh, live and call the wharf home, whether uh, throughout the year or at different times. Uh, we know the marine mammals like sea otters and sea lions and um, and dolphins and things that will swim near the wharf. Uh, we know there are 
number of bird species, mollusks, ground fish, I mean, the list goes on. Um, and we have a, an obligation to, to ensure that what we're doing on the wharf is uh, sensitive to them and helps sustain it for, for their habitat going forward. Uh, as part of that, we've been in a collaboration with the uh, UCSC over the years, uh, with the Green Wharf Program, um, which is, uh, I believe, spearheaded on the city side, uh, largely by Tiffany Wise West, the city's uh, climate program manager. Um, but we've been able to explore pilot solar projects, wind projects, and other, uh, other green and sustainability projects on the wharf through that. Uh, the next goal is really about creating a wharf that will be more resilient. Um, we know the climate is changing. We know that the Pacific storms are getting stronger and the waves are, creating, are transferring more energy into the wharf structure, uh, even as it ages. Uh, so we need to be very mindful of what we do to the wharf uh, and that it will be creating a, a more resilient, uh, defensible space uh, that is stronger and, and, and able to withstand these forces. Similarly, uh, the coronavirus has, has uh, highlighted some real sensitivities economically for the wharf. Uh, three of our businesses today are, are closed for, uh, indefinitely, although they all hope to reopen. Um, Jill is under new management. Um, but they uh, are still waiting for the, the sort of economic circumstances and the, and the virus to get under control to a point where it's it, it financially um, you know, feasible. Um, so we have to think about, as we're, we're building forward on the wharfs, um, how are we ensuring that we're able to sustain our, our legacy businesses, these, these local partners that have been there for decades? Um, we hate to see them go, and we want to find ways to, to ensure that it works for the city, but also for them. Um, and, and to think that it, it can't happen here, it, it already has. Um, back in 1941, there was a series of fires that broke out on the wharf, uh, put out by fishermen with, with uh, you know, water hoses underneath. Today we have a sprinkler system. Um, but if you can imagine, you know, in the height of summer, getting a fire truck out there with all the cars, uh, that's part of the challenges that the, the work master plan is trying to address and figure out solutions to. Um, likewise, the, the picture at the bottom left shows you what the end of the work looks like uh, before the old uh, warehouse building was take down, taken down or around the same time. You can see how the, the stringers and caps and, and pilings had started to fail, and that's how we lost uh, about 45 feet from the end of the wharf. Um, it also led to new opportunity. Uh, when the warehouse building came down, the, the Wildlife Conservation Board created the, the fishing park at the end, which is now very popular for its sea lion viewing hole. So, uh, uh, you know, the property of the wharf is a, a state of change uh, in the, the uh, sort of inhospitable Pacific Ocean. Um, the wharf adapts and grows with, needs, with the needs. Uh, and to that regard, uh, the exhibit at the top shows a little bit about all the various changes that have happened on the wharf. It's not 100%. Um, there's a few changes that have happened uh, within some of these spaces, but this generally shows you uh, how the wharf has grown from its original shape uh, into the wharf we know today. Uh, with each one, it's created more economic opportunity that's gone into sustaining the wharf, as well as increasing public access um, to the, the Mount Array Bay and the businesses and, and out there. Um, right now, though, there's a, there's a greater need than what I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, I talked about uh, the, the regulatory framework that we need, the ability to go after outside funding. But the fact of the matter is the wharf has, um, has not been able to sustain itself for a long time. Um, in uh, the, the chart I'm about to show you, at least the last six years, it's been running uh, at a deficit. Um, and would be even more so if it weren't for some insurance proceeds from the tsunami. Um, the two years where it almost balances out had over nearly $800,000 in insurance proceeds uh, that went into repairs um, that buoyed its, its financials. Um, looking at uh, crunching the numbers going back a bit farther, but it's a little trickier. Um, so uh, we really, at a, yeah, at a time where the, the city is facing um, budget shortfalls likely to last into 2028, uh, we've got to find opportunities to, to help balance the books on, on our public facilities like the wharf. Uh, uh, additionally, the wharf has an infrastructure backlog um, of 12 to $14 million uh, estimated in today's dollars. Um, these are, are, are things that haven't been addressed over the years and, and gradually grow weaker and more dangerous until we're able to fix them. Um, 
As I mentioned, the work business is struggling from coronavirus, but even before that, uh, the city had been trying to balance its books by raising rent uh, out there since at least 2010. And in the process, uh, the businesses have struggled against the rent increases, but also uh, rising costs of labor, materials, uh, products, uh, food costs, uh, insurance, utilities, you name it. Uh, everything's getting more expensive. Uh, and likewise, their prices have gotten more expensive and, and less accessible to many in our community, um, just as they try to sustain uh, their bottom line. So we've got to find ways to, to spread that burden and to bring in outside funding. And the master plan is, is critical to that. Um, as I mentioned, here's a, a bit of a picture of what the, the wharf revenues and expenses have looked like over the past six years. Um, as you can see, the balance in red has generally uh, been below, uh, below zero and has been subsidized by the general fund. Uh, this includes the, 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 the three wharf operations that are billed to the wharf, uh, the wharf account in the general fund. And that's the, uh, the wharf maintenance and operation, the parking um, out there on the wharf, and the marine rescue. All those are uh, credited against the revenues that the wharf generates. Um, and those two years in the middle where it almost balances out, uh, those are those two years where we were buoyed by insurance proceeds <coughs> and about $100,000 in the grant. Uh, likewise, the city has, has, has tried to invest in capital projects to the extent it's been able. Um, but even the total amount there is well short of our infrastructure backlog, which has continued to grow over the years. Um, the two, two largest expenditures there are that wharf master plan, uh, which, as I mentioned, the Economic Development Administration um, urged us to do um, in order to become eligible for other funding. Uh, it simply wouldn't fund a rehabilitation project um, in light of our tsunami disaster without a plan in place. Um, and then the, the other big expenditure is that Wharf Beach intersection, the roundabout, uh, all of that that was done. Um, big facelift for the beach area, but uh, not a whole lot for the structure. Um, diving into that infrastructure backlog a little bit, and I just, you know, it, it, some people will say that we're, we're trying to create a crisis here, but I think it's more about opening people's eyes to the reality. Uh, if you've been out there, even just walking the wharf, uh, you probably have been rattled by the, the crumbling pavements and sort of uneven walkways, and, and, and maybe you've seen some rot in various places. That stuff happens. The wharf crew does the best they can to keep up with it. Um, they do a great job, but they can't do it alone. Um, and so the wharf engineering report that was done in 2014 as part of the master plan uh, really did a, a holistic evaluation of the wharf. Uh, it had... They went and did uh, core samples of pilings. They investigated virtually every, every piece of that structure um, and identified uh, both things that are, that are positive and reassuring as well as things that, uh, you know, will, will continue to grow over time until they hit a tipping point. Um, so the backlog, as I mentioned, is a result of age, wear, and deferred maintenance uh, where we haven't been able to fund the type of maintenance that's required. Um, it, it, it includes the cost to rehab, rehab existing structures, including what you see there, and it was originally estimated at 11.6 million in 2014. But the escalate it for inflation, it's, it's likely over 14 million today. Um, a key piece of, uh, of it is, is really uh, reinforcing failing members uh, to improve the lateral stability of the wharf. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but it's also good to keep in mind that um, while we understand that, that this is a, a, an infrastructure problem that we have to deal with, uh, Right now, it's really, um, it falls on us. Uh, grants for rehab um, are incredibly rare. Uh, almost every funding agency at the state and federal level wants to see new construction. Um, that's sort of the growth machine mentality that's out there. Um, it's not necessarily what we want, um, but it's the reality. Uh, by bringing in new projects, we can bring in funding from the outside uh, that will help shore up the, the critical infrastructure that's there today. Um, so in the work, uh, Engineering study uh, or engineering mm -hmm. report, they did a uh, damage assessment looking at the, the status of various features, um, looking at the, the structural design uh, where they've got, you know, reinforced uh, stringers underneath to, to, for the heavy traffic areas and a little bit broader and the, the more open, uh, less vehicle-oriented spaces. Uh, they did visual inspections. They did core samples. Um, overall, they found the pilings were in good condition. Uh, only about 5%, uh, a little less than 5% needed to be replaced. However, um, it's not just the pilings only really support the structure itself. The structure is, is critical to holding them all together and to resisting the sheer force of the waves. Um, 
Other weaknesses identified in the engineering report include those, the, the, the deterioration of caps and stringers and deck rod, uh, corroded hardware. Um, it noted that towards the end of the war, um, sections of up to of 50 percent or more uh, of the hardware are, you know, severely corroded and would need replacement. Um, similarly, A-frames, where we span across um, across failing piles to, to keep up the structure above, uh, namely under buildings, uh, those are vulnerabilities that we we have to address every every so often, um, as well as spans that are under 10 feet, or, or sorry, over 10 feet. Um, just uh, some pictures of what kind of some of that stuff looks like. Um, up at the top left, you can see where uh, uh, a cap that supports the, the cross braces or, or um, I guess, stringers and such, uh, you can see how it's failing around the, the bolts that hold it together. Um, this is not uncommon. Um, it, it, it can be quite structural or, or strong for a long time, but, you know, who's to say uh, when it fails? And, and the part of the work crew's job is to stay up on these things uh, to the extent they have resources. Um, uh, the A-frames, you can see them in the top right, uh, where there's like a failing pile and it's difficult to replace because maybe there's a building on top. Uh, they've got to, to spread the weight uh, from above off to the, the nearby piles. And that's one of the approaches that we do uh, to keep the wharf standing without disrupting the, up, the, the above deck parts of the wharf. Um, but that can only be done for so long. And it generally leads to the buildings having a, a, a lifespan of between 40 and 60 years. Um, much less back in the day when the buildings were, were less, um, less sturdy. Um, other vulnerabilities in the bottom left, you can see where um, splices to those major beams, uh, sometimes they were made without having a, a, a piling to support them underneath. Just a weakness, um, on the bottom right, you can see what that should look like uh, for the maximum strength. Um, these are the sorts of things that fit into that infrastructure backlog uh, but it also gives you a little bit of an idea of what the wharf crew is up against as far as maintaining over 4,400 piles um, and a half mile long structure out in the ocean uh, with a very limited budget. Um, the, the big thing we're, we're worried about though is that shear force um, and, and what the wharf master plan is looking to do through its expansions is really to, to broaden it, uh, broaden the wharf a little bit and to uh, give it more lateral stability and strength against this force. So when waves come up against uh, the sides of the wharf or the ends of the wharf, uh, they push on it. And the, the pilings are not like a building on land. They shift and move. Uh, you can see it uh, when you go out there and you see the sort of the, 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 the pavement cracking along these straight lines. That's typically uh, what's happening as the deck boards shift and move underneath. Um, and so it happens over time. It, it's part of life on the wharf. Um, and, you know, originally the wharf wasn't paved. Uh, so it, it flexes a bit more. Um, but as the, the waves get stronger and the forces get tougher and the, the wharf gets older, uh, there's a need to, to make a, it more resilient through, through strengthening these aspects. Um, this is just one example. As I mentioned, you can see in the pavement those lines uh, where, where they're kind of almost perfectly along those welding cores. Uh, but with the shear forces and then the traffic coming across, you can see how it warps in places. How over time it shifts and continues to shift in different directions. We need uh, we need the resources to go out and address these issues, and the easiest way to get them, uh, and the most promising, is to be able to have a plan and environmental report in hand that we can go after funding agencies for. Um, and to those that say that the that the, the issues on the wharf, uh, while they're you know while they can be addressed and it's not a critical failure at this time, they're they're pervasive. Uh, on the top, you can see where there's uh, where the report identified cap and stringer damage, uh, where you saw unsupported splices. Those are just uh, you know, supplemental weaknesses that could at any time uh, build with the damaged piles and the A-frames and the other things that you see on the bottom. Um, you know, and, and kind of in the bottom right, uh, I guess about two thirds down in the bottom, you can see all those purple lines. Uh, that's underneath the Miramar site. Uh, that's why we're working diligently to secure outside funding. Um, from the Economic Development Administration to, to rehabilitate those piles um, so that we can rebuild on that site. Um, but as I mentioned, over time, that's just reality on the wharf. They're bombarded by uh, logs and trees that wash down in the winter, uh, the wave forces and um, uh, natural in, like marine borers that, that dig in and eat the piling. 
Uh, those things happen. It's part of life on the wharf. Um, but it, we don't have the resources to keep up with it at this time. Uh, so, uh, putting that stuff behind us and getting into uh, what's exciting about the plan and what it, what it brings and, and what raises some concerns for some people is what is the Wharf Master Plan? Uh, first and foremost, it was developed through a public process. Um, before my time, um, so I'm just conveying the, the record that I have from that, um, but I understand it involved a, quite a number of community meetings, outreach, uh, uh, newspaper articles, advertising, and um, an event. Uh, the, it was, uh, it was uh, revealed at the, uh, or a draft report was highlighted at the 100th anniversary of the war in 2014 and, and got a lot of feedback then. Um, secondly, it's a framework. It's not a prescription. It, it just basically sets opportunity sites. It calls for uh, some vision of, of what they could be, but they're really there for the community to decide upon going forward. Um, those buildings that are there, the, it proposed in the master plan, the gateway, the pavilion, uh, the landmark building, any of those uh, are left at, at a very programmatic, uh, pro programmatic level, um, which means that they're, they're not going to go out and be built tomorrow. Like I said, the city doesn't have the funds for it. Uh, we don't have stakeholders in place for it. Uh, there's a whole long community process that will need to come uh, around those. Uh, but by approving the master plan, we create the opportunity for that to happen and for those discussions to evolve, uh, as well as the fundraising to go with it. Um, so in that regard, it, it sets rules and goals and guidelines. And really what we're excited about is that it, increase, it increases public access by two and a half acres, uh, giving more people uh, a more comfortable way to be out there on the wharf uh, to better experience the, the ocean environment um, and uh, under the, the coastal submissions purview to really increase our access to this coastal resource. So uh, the public process and visioning process it began in August of 2013. Uh, there were a series of eight stakeholder and focus group meetings. Um, more than 1,400 mailings uh, were sent out to nearby property owners and stakeholders, or, or residents, property owners, and stakeholders. Um, there was ongoing stakeholder engagement on certain aspects, and there were um, updates provided to City Council, Planning Commission, and Parks and Recreation Commission. Um, after, the, after that period, a, a draft was prepared in April of 2014. Uh, when the draft was, uh, was finished, they held the milestone meetings, uh, which was advertised uh, in a twice weekly ad in the Sentinel. A uh, press release to over 75 media outlets was uh, sent. Again, the mailed notices. A, uh, a, a briefing paper on the master plan was released through the Santa Cruz Neighbors Organization. A uh, web page uh, was posted. And then a, uh, a scale model of the wharf master plan improvements was provided at the, uh, at the 100th anniversary celebrations of the wharf. Um, and so there was a lot of visibility that was gained at that time and a public process that, you know, to date the staff has been um, protective of. Um, not that we don't feel like there's more improvements to make to the master plan. Uh, it's really about respecting the, the work that went into creating it in the first place and making sure that we're in a public forum before we make any, any changes or, or other suggestions to it. Um, going into, uh, from, from that, that, that process, uh, we entered into the environmental review process. So on October 28, 2014, the City Council accepted the Master Plan and Engineering Report, and they directed staff to prepare an environmental review uh, slash an initial study under CEQA. And so for those who don't know, the CEQA is the California Environmental Quality Act, and it, it's intended to reveal potential negative impacts of, uh, negative or positive impacts of, a, uh, of any proposed project on the environment. So staff went ahead and had that prepared. Uh, Dudek was our consultant on it. Um, and I believe I'm joined today by Stephanie Str uh, Strelo from uh, Judex, who is our environmental consultant, uh, as well as I should have mentioned John uh, Wabachi, who's our work supervisor, and it has spent more than 30 years on the work, uh, keeping it standing. Um, so with the mitigated next deck released in March of 2016, uh, it went out to public comment and was brought back for uh, initial revision and then released again for public comment. Um, when that closed, uh, the Planning Commission recommended, uh, unanimously recommended approval of the master plan and the, uh, the mitigated neg dec, or negative declaration um, uh, related to the initial study. And then in November 22nd, 2016, um, subsequent to a, a strong community um, outreach, or sorry, strong community, um, I hesitate to say opposition, but uh, urging by the public um, that we conduct a full EIR. Uh, staff changed their, their recommendation on the dais um, with city council uh, to 
instead of moving forward with master plan and the in initial study at that time uh, to prepare a full EIR. Um, a notice of preparation was issued uh, the following May in 2017, and a scoping session was held in June. Uh, the scoping session helped set what the targets of study are for an EIR. Um, and at that meeting uh, and uh, comments that were sent in around it um, helped frame up what we'll see in the EIR to come. Uh, an administrative draft, so that's the internal review of the EIR, was prepared in uh, October 2017 and circulated between departments. However, uh, due to some changes in, in council dynamics that happened in 2018 and in a, in a retirement and, and myself being hired on in late 2018, uh, it's just been a bit of a, a you know, learning curve and, and uh, some delays that were unintended. Um, so beginning in March of 2020, uh, we issued the, uh, the public, the notice of completion and the availability of the draft EIR uh, for public comment and extended that review period for an additional 14 days, uh, basically to, the, to the, the nearly the full extent uh, recommended under the CEQA guidelines. Um, following uh, the comments we received uh, in that uh, draft EIR, uh, our consultant uh, prepared comments uh, in concert with the city, uh, and we had issued the availability of the final EIR in September uh, of 2020. And then yesterday, we were at Historic Preservation Commission uh, discussing this very topic, and today we're here. So um, we'll keep going there. So uh, moving on to the Wharf Master Plan report, this is just a little summary of, of what the, the master plan proposes versus what was there before. These numbers um, from, from um, Norm's presentation, so they're close to right. Uh, commercial uses currently are down about 7,000 square feet because uh, we took down the Miramar building just a heads up there. Um, but overall, the work today is about uh, 7.5 acres, um, and it's, uh, it, the proposed expansion would bring another uh, two and a half acres. Of that, the vast majority of it is public access space. Um, there's commercial infill and a little bit of retail use growth. But all of that is really proposed within the existing building footprint, so very close to. Uh, it's not intended to take up any of the new public space um, that's out there. Um, and overall, the, the new commercial would be between 20 and 30 percent um, growth, uh, is the, maybe up to a third. Uh, what's new in the, in the Wharf Master Plan? Um, a number of things. Uh, the first item is, is the gateway entrance. So this improvement is about uh, alleviating some of the traffic congestion on work on uh, Beach Street, uh, creating a more efficient queuing uh, for people to come onto the wharf, and creating some self-pay options for people to get off the wharf more quickly. Um, it would also include a, a gateway signage, or it could. Um, however, that signage hasn't been fully developed and would be uh, really subject to additional community process. Um, in the North Master Plan and EIR, there's, there's a sign proposed with a certain dimension. Um, that's more of a... a Giving it, uh, wet, giving it some framing uh, to study uh, through that community process. There's no commitment that it has to be quite as large as proposed uh, in the master plan. Uh, one of the, the items that we're really excited about is this, uh, this Eastern Promenade. Uh, this is a, a pedestrian bicycle connection um, that would expand public access out to the wharf through sustainable transportation. Um, it would extend the wharf up to about 30, uh, 26 feet, um, which would include additional fishing area and seat walls along the, the eastern side of the wharf, as well as the, the bikeway, and um, which doubles as a emergency vehicle access. So as I said before, you can imagine trying to get a fire truck out there in the, in the heat of summer uh, when the place is packed. Uh, this would make that much easier um, in an emergency. Uh, alongside the Eastern Promenade is a proposed small boat landing. Uh, so today there's a, I want to say there's about five davits out there that serve a variety of, five davits and, and uh, landings that serve a variety of functions, uh, but which do not provide adequate accessible um, access to the ocean. So if you've got special needs, uh, need a wheelchair, things like that, it, it's very difficult to, to use those, um, which makes it difficult for, for our commercial partners to be sustainable on the wharf. Um, and we, we really haven't been able to, to support maritime operations from the wharf, uh, be they fishing, whale watches, uh, you know, any of those sort of uses uh, well, without more accessible landings. Um, the small boat landing would consolidate the more human-powered uh, boat travel. And so we're talking about the kayak rentals, the boat rentals, the fishing boat rentals, um, and potentially, you know, dinghies and things from uh, private vessels would be able to land there uh, with more easy access to the wharf. Um, 
This would consolidate those uses, which would free up more deck space for fishing and sightseeing, uh, as well as, again, providing that uh, universally accessible access to the water. Uh, that promenade would continue um, down along the eastern side and extend down to the uh, nearly the end of the wharf. Um, I meant to correct that. Uh, what it says down below, the next item is the uh, the steel. Well, it says steel landing. Those are really uh, ledgers. Um, they're they're lateral bracing that the seals today love. Um, you'll see them out there laying on them. Um, but they would be more significantly created uh, in shoring up the end of the wharf. Um, and so the hope is that you get increased. Uh, as a designer's hope is that you get increased uh, sighting potential of the sea lions uh, by having a little bit more favorable. Um, ledgers, uh, but uh, it's really about uh, strengthening up the wharf so that that end uh, can hold up to the forces we're, we're increasingly facing. Um, as I mentioned, there's a south landing proposed, or, or I alluded to. The south landing is uh, for, for larger vessels. Um, according to the, the master plan, the design text for that uh, boat were really designed for uh, equivalent to like a Coast Guard rescue vessel, a Coast Guard cutter. Um, no more than about 110 feet long, um, intended for, for research vessels, bay cruises like the O'Neill's or the Chardonnay, uh, whale watching, fishing charters, and, and potentially commercial fishing. Uh, we know that uh, in speaking with some of the business owners out there and others, uh, there's a real desire to see uh, more of the fishing, you know, more connection to the fishing industry that, that's recovered um, and that it needs more opportunities to kind of, you know, bring the ocean to table uh, experience uh, to Santa Cruz and, and the visiting public. Um, it's something our, our restaurants want, it's something the fishing, uh, our, our fishing industry wants, um, and we really feel like it would bring uh, more of the historical feel of the wharf back there uh, if we can support that. Um, one thing I want to clarify, and I'll, I'll clarify again later, uh, the South Landing is in no way intended to service any sort of ocean liner or uh, traveling cruise ship industry, nothing of the sort. Um, one, we don't think that the, the depths at that area are really supportive of it. Can't even imagine what the um, regulatory hurdles are. And the city just doesn't have any interest in that. Uh, certainly the community doesn't. We've heard from them. Um, and it's not something that was ever intended in the master plan. And we've tried to clarify that in staff recommendation. Um, you know, we don't want to prohibit the, the sort of dinner cruises and things that are on a smaller scale that, that we currently have. Uh, but we certainly do not want um, you know, voyaging vessels uh, coming to Santa Cruz. Um, coming uh, next is this uh, stepped overlook at the end. So as I mentioned, uh, with the, the new ledgers, there's a hope that uh, we'd also supplement that with more of a, a terraced overlook that would create sort of amphitheater seating a little closer to the water, uh, giving you a more intimate experience of the wharf and some different viewing angles down towards uh, where we hope the sea lions will, will find, a, you know, a, a, an enriched I wouldn't say new home, they're already there, uh, but one that's a little bit more supportive uh, to them while also strengthening the work. Um, probably the, the most contentious item is the landmark building uh, that's proposed. And so this is uh, intended to bring, or the designer's intent was to bring back a, a, a sort of a focal feature at the end of the wharf that was reminiscent of the old original warehouse that was built at the end of the wharf. And so, well, it originally served fish, or shipping and then eventually fishing, and, um, and it came down in the 60s. It was sort of an Art Deco-ish uh, utilitarian warehouse um, that was very iconic at the end of the wharf. Uh, and the, the designer's intent was to create something of that magnitude that would stand out against other, uh, other improvements on the wharf while providing a, a cultural hub and, and destination. Um, so the thought is that uh, that building could support um, potentially a museum, uh, whether it be one for you know, wharf history or serving or any number of, uh, of, of things that Santa Cruz has to celebrate uh, and that would be developed through additional community outreach and discussion and, and really coalition building. Um, or it could be something like a, like a maker's market or a, an Abbott Square type thing. It, it's really a, a flexible placeholder for us to determine over the next 20, 30 years what happens when uh, the end of the war has to be redeveloped. You know, as I mentioned, buildings have to come down every 50 or 60 years to replace pilings and things underneath them. There will be an opportunity over the life of this plan to revision what happens at the end of the war. This uh, provides the environmental review and, and one potential aspect of what that could be um, without specifying that that's what it has to be. Um, also, uh, the end of the war is, as 
you know, shoring it up further, there'd be a little bit more of an extension on the west side, providing a, a more 360-degree circuit. Um, this part of it would be at grade, um, just really extending it out for more uh, foot space and, and sight team. Um, and then it would continue. Uh, and then as you go back towards the commons area where the stage is today, there's a proposal to have a, a pavilion structure. Uh, this would really create more of a 360-day-a-year um, event venue, potentially, uh, for community events, concerts, uh, really whatever the community wants to do out there, uh, but in a way that we could use it throughout the year, um, which would help supplement wharf revenues. You know, currently, most of the revenue of the wharf is generated during the summer when we have tourist crowds that come in. Uh, a lot of the businesses rely on that funds, uh, those funds to get them through the winter when it's really sustained by locals. Um, and, and so by creating opportunities for 360-day-a-year uh, visitation, uh, the hope is that we'll be able to you know, sustain the businesses better and sustain the wharf uh, in perpetuity. And then along the back side here is this proposed western walkway. So this one uh, would actually be recessed a little bit closer to the water. Um, intended to, to not block views of the restaurant, but really what it is is it's a resilience measure. It, it's intended as a buffer uh, to protect the, the pilings underneath the building so that they, it, it could fail first. Um, it would be designed in a way that it would have uh, flow-through paneling, so whereas much of the work today is, is, a, is a hard wooden or, or paved structure, this one would be more permeable to allow the force of the waves to go through it uh, while still being very walkable um, you know, and closable uh, in inclement weather. Uh, but again, it's there to intercept uh, the logs and things that are damaging to the, the building piles, uh, as well as uh, the Coastal Commission really, really wanted to see 360 degree, uh, 360 degree travel around the wharf uh, for maximum public access. Uh, and the last thing here is the Welcome Center. So down near where the, uh, the Boat Rentals Plaza is today and the Marcella, uh, there's an idea of creating a better sense of arrival as people come onto the wharf, having sort of a Welcome Center that, that creates a uh, a welcoming place for people to come in and get oriented to what their experience is and what to see out there, um, and really to encourage them to go and explore the entire length of the wharf and see what it has to offer. Um, the master plan anticipates that it might also be a home for community groups, um, like the open water swimmers. Um, being proximate to the small boat landing, it would provide easy access for them to get down underneath the wharf, uh, perhaps with changing rooms and saunas, um, things that would really... Uh, help support that, that active organization that's in the, the Warp and Beach area. Uh, but again, you know, the programming of these, the, any of these structures and, and uh, you know, what they will be is, is subject to, to community engagement and, and everyone deciding what, what should come next. Um, so a little more detail on these. Uh, at the top, you can see a, a section view of what uh, an expanded wide and wharf would look like. Uh, you can see what one rendering of, of one of the buildings would be. It's got a little bit of an awning here um, with a more open layout, so you can sort of see from the street straight through the space and out. Um, you've got the, uh, the lower western walkway and, and a blow up there. You can see it's below grade, and then it would have these pilings here that would be uh, smaller and easier to replace uh, than ones that would be under the building. So while, uh, you know, the hope is it doesn't, you know, it doesn't break immediately, uh, the idea is that it's there as, as the the easiest thing to repair um, because we don't want to disrupt businesses or, or have to take them down because of increasingly harsh storms. Um, and then on the eastern side, uh, we've got this eastern promenade. Um, so there's, you're looking at this bikeway that would be for, you know, walking and, and travel. Um, you know, currently, it shows a very generous size. Um, it, it could be uh, – it, it would really be sized based on what's needed for, for emergency access as well as, as for what the public wants. Um, but along the left side of it, uh, on the eastern edge of the wharf, you can see these seating areas and, and spaces for the fishermen and sightseers to really just get comfortable and hang out and enjoy the, the wharf for what it is. Um, and on the opposite side, by the parking, we've got some seat walls there uh, that will help ensure that we have less cars driving into the water. Um, it's happened many times before on the wharf, uh, and we really, it's a good thing to try and stop that. Um, and up top here, uh, you can just see what one potential uh, scheme is for the, um, the small boat landing. So it's got through a series of ramps that would be able to provide uh, basically wheelchair access or, or universal access down to the water grade. It would have the, the appropriate lifting uh, structures, uh, davits for, for rental boats. Um, it may have other support uh, resources or rental facility. Um, and, and there's a, a number of layouts that were explored in the development of the master plan. So some, some designs call for, for it kind of switch backing under the wharf so it doesn't build out so far from it. 
Um, that would all be part of a, a subsequent community engagement and design process. Um, and those resilience improvements I mentioned. Um, so again, the emergency access using that eastern promenade, uh, that would, would really help uh, in the event of a fire or, or got a bit of a terrorist attack or something else that could happen. Um, the, small boat, or the small boat landing and the south landing could serve as evacuation points. Uh, should there be a, a failure on the wharf or an event that it limits access, um, they would provide universal access to rescue vessels. Um, and the Western Walkway, as I mentioned, uh, would itself become a, a barrier to marine debris, uh, helping ensure those wayward redwood trees uh, don't go knocking out pilings under our buildings. Um, the accessible landings, as I mentioned, uh, you can see them at top, uh, what they, they might look like, um, and some pictures at the bottom showing kind of what we, are, we currently have. Um, at the very far right, you can see the public landing number two across from Stagnaro that uh, never really recovered uh, from the tsunami, unfortunately, um, and is, is generally dominated by sea lions. Um, but it, 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 between the, the obsolete davit at, uh, at the top and the, the, the access challenges, um, it just hasn't been able to be used. Uh, the other landings, the kayak rentals one and, and the, I think that's public landing number one, uh, still usable, um, but not accessible in, in the you know, as we really should be trying to provide. Um, so within the master plan, there's also three new cultural buildings. Um, these are the, the ones that um, that the Historic Commission recommended we, we maximize their height at about 35 feet. Uh, the master plan originally called for 45, um, or rather up to 45. Uh, and then after the, uh, the EIR was prepared, staff kind of looked at the, the alternatives and, and couldn't find a compelling reason why we'd need 45. Um, so we felt that 40 feet, uh, which is consistent with the current zoning for the area, uh, just seemed like a cleaner, uh, cleaner point to pl uh, put it, um, with the understanding that it, it provides flexibility, but uh, that the city doesn't have to build up to that high. It would really be dictated at a design level uh, once the project um, started to gather hold and was you know, proposed with the community's support. All right. Oh, and that uh, at the, the Picture on the bottom left of the landmark building, you can see sort of the, the step terrace, how it might relate to those uh, ledgers for the, the sea lions might like down there. Um, and that, that landmark building, as it was proposed in the master plan, was really intended to harken back to the original warehouse that was out there. Um, as I mentioned, it was originally uh, for freight shipping and passenger travel, um, but you know it came down in the 1960s, uh, despite being a very iconic feature on the wharf. Um, to help illustrate what these scale challenges were, uh, when the master plan was developed, they had a uh, they had a scale model of, of the improvements prepared, and they displayed it at the 100th anniversary of the the wharf master or of the wharf, um, and people were able to, to look at it and engage with really what does this mean as far as as um, you know if we went to the heights that were proposed. Uh, additionally, in the master plan, there is limited new commercial proposed. Um, namely, it, it's looking at uh, filling in and building up a little bit of the, the spaces that are already there. Uh, so some businesses, uh, mostly restaurants, would have the opportunity to maybe go to two floors, um, and uh, which would help generate more revenues and sustain those businesses, uh, but also provide uh, you know expanded views of the bay. Um, other infill is kind of around uh, opportunity sites where there's strange heaps and buildings or, or a little bit of space by the commons. Um, and uh, it also proposes uh, certain liner uses, but I'll get into more detail a little bit later. Um, lastly, the, I think this last, yeah, lastly the, the entrance gateway. Um, this is uh, what the, the master plan kind of shows. Um, it has a, a more firm structure to sort of define the entrance and a sense of arrival, uh, but it also doubles as a security measure. Um, that beam that goes across the top is really there to house uh, roll gates and, and things that can be brought down, both after the wharf closes at 2 a.m. Um, as well as in the event of an emergency and climate weather, um, we can secure the wharf as needed. Uh, the signage at the top, again, while the master plan shows dimensions for the purposes of CEQA and analysis, those dimensions are very much uh, in flux and would be subject uh, with the signage design itself uh, to a community engagement process that the city's committed to. Um, the master plan outlines a number of policies. I know those are kind of hard to read, uh, probably on most people's screens. Uh, but they're really uh, intended to, to not only increase the resiliency of the wharf, but to bring it back to its more historical character, 
uh, and to celebrate it as this unique physical and cultural landmark. Um, it provides opportunities for, uh, for better wayfinding and orientation. Uh, there's just a whole breadth of, of different policies within the master plan. I encourage people to read them and, and see how they feel about it. Uh, there's also design standards in the master plan. These are intended to shape uh, how buildings and renovations to buildings uh, will, will grow um, so that we, we've got uh, more design intent as far as leading the wharf in a direction that, that seems cohesive and which is in keeping with its historical character. Uh, so again, you know, I welcome comments from the Planning Commission on this. Um, you know, certainly our intent is to, to preserve and, and enhance the, the historic feeling of the war. Uh, although creating more economic opportunity and, and, fiscal, and sustainability in the process. Um, with those design standards, there's a call for more building transparency. So you kind of look back at the, the work of yesteryear and a lot of those spaces really opened up right into the, in, into the public uh, promenade and sidewalk so people could just kind of engage with the businesses and, uh, and the activity within. Um, you know, we still see that today in Stegnaros or at Firefish with their exhibition kitchen and, and their, you know, great glass walls. Um, we want to see more of that going forward with, uh, with new development um, and renovation. A lot of the buildings that were built back in the day um, have a lot of blank walls. Uh, and that's something that wants to be discouraged. Um, so again, along those lines are these liner uses. So where today we might have a, a blank wall outside of Jilda's or, or you know, where Miramar was um, that would have been hiding walk-in freezers and restrooms and sort of unsightly back of house operations, uh, the master plan is calling for pushing those back a little bit, um, masking them with more street frontage activity. Um, so it might be a, a walk-up oyster bar or a gift shop that you can engage with right away, um, but really activating every square inch of that uh, promenade, um, you know, or walk. I guess that, there's the eastern promenade and the one by the businesses. I'm not sure what to call it, um, but really activating every every step of the way so that you feel excited about being on the wharf and you want to continue walking down it. Um, you know, today a lot of people don't walk the entire length of the wharf, and, and it impacts businesses and their viability. So we really want to. To, to encourage it through an exciting environment. Uh, second floor uses like restaurants. Um, you know, they could come in a variety of forms. Uh, it might be something like uh, the wharf house out on the Capitola Wharf, where it's very open, um, very fluid, and not fully enclosed. It could be something like Stegnaros, which has that really great, um, almost like a cruise ship view out over the end of the wharf. Um, or it could be, you know, any number of things. It's, it's up to imagination, but it's really about uh, creating opportunity for for sustaining the businesses and more, you know, uh, public access to the coastal resource. Uh, signage, uh, the, the guidelines, or sorry, the design standards talk about, um, you know, more of this sort of heraldic uh, hanging signage, the blade signage uh, that you can sort of see from a distance and it's more engaging as you walk down the pedestrian way. Um, you see some of that uh, today down at Signaro's and at various other places. Uh, it also limits uh, the size and scale of major signage uh, up on the buildings. Um, it sets, I think, a one and a half foot uh, maximum height and a 20 foot length and some other specifics. Um, okay. I'm missing something. Hold on. There was, I think, something moved. Oh, I, okay, that's what it is. Let me just fix that. Um, Back here. All right, there was a misplaced slide. Um, so uh, the EIR. Okay, 
the AR, uh, through the scoping session, designated a number of topics for further investigation after the initial study. Uh, those uh, relate to aesthetics, uh, aesthetic impacts, biological and resource impacts, uh, cultural resource impacts, which I mentioned earlier with the Historic Preservation Commission and, and their analysis, uh, geological, hydrology, and uh, water quality impacts, as well as transportation, traffic, and parking, and water and energy. Uh, so diving into the IR and what, uh, what was studied additionally and the findings, uh, we'll just give a little overview on those things before we uh, get into public comment or into uh, questions by the commission. Uh, so aesthetic, uh, under CEQA, aesthetic, uh, there are certain thresholds that have to be met to, to uh, qualify as a substantial impact. Um, first and foremost, a, a project has to have a substantial adverse effect on the scenic vista. Uh, they have to substantially damage uh, scenic resources, uh, including but not limited to what you see there. Um, and in non-urbanized areas, there are certain additional or, or alternative uh, requirements, as well as in urbanized er areas as far as how it applies to existing zoning and other regulations. And then um, create a, a new source of light or glare that would affect the day or nighttime views in the area. And so um, aesthetic seems, uh, it could be, you know, could seem to be somewhat of a subjective uh, standard without, um, without a, a baseline objective uh, threshold established. Uh, and to the extent that Santa Cruz has one, it is in the um, in our local coastal plan and our general plan, where we've designated significant view sheds. Um, so this was adopted by the by the city with the general plan, um, and it it looks at uh, significant panoramic views that are out there in the beach area, uh, as well as um, as well as you know visual landmarks and things there. Uh, so the extent that uh, that Judac, our environmental consultant, was able to to align with this in analysis of the aesthetic impacts on the wharf uh, or with the wharf master plan, uh, that's basically what they did. Um, so as you can see, where the points are of viewing that they proposed uh, or that are in this document, uh, Judac essentially went to replicate those uh, through their photo simulations <coughs> that were taken, um, both from the beach area, the beach uh, <coughs> down on the wharf and uh, off of the sort of bluffs by uh, Seabright Beach there. Or I think it might have been off the bluffs. Um, they uh, followed that up with a uh, uh, what's called a photo simulation. So they had a local architect uh, sort of scale out what those buildings might look like um, from these various vantage points. Uh, so this is looking from West Cliff. You can see at top, uh, you know, what the wharf looks like today and, and what it might look like if those buildings were built to their maximum heights. Um, to a landmark down the right, the events pavilion, you can see what that lowered western walkway might look like as uh, as a slight change from the uh, from the pilings you can see today. This is looking from Main Beach, um, what it might have looked like, uh, what one you know version of an entrance gate might look like, what a, an expanded lifeguard station might look like, gateway building, you know, again, one model of a small boat landing. Uh, all of it is subject to, to design and and further community engagement. So what you see there is only the maximum extent in the master plan. It is not necessarily what will be built. Um, this is looking from Cowell Beach at the same sort of layout um, on the left. Uh, you can see what the landmark building might look like, the gateway building, uh, again, the, the standard life station and the uh, entrance gates. Uh, and then lastly, looking from over I Seabright, uh, kind of what that, what that might look like. Um, and you can kind of imagine what these, uh, with, you know, particularly with the landmark building, look, harkening back to days past, um, you know, that's uh, one shot of what the wharf looked like probably in the 1950s um, towards the end. You can see there's some, some second story buildings already there on the wharf, um, the, the historic landmark building kind of dominating the end of the wharf. Um, but, you know, it's a different change than it is today. Uh, the next topic is the biological resource. Um, so namely, the, the EIR found that there, be, there could be potential impacts from noise disturbance and disruption to nesting, uh, bird nesting. Um, as a result, it recommends uh, certain mitigation measures, including uh, developing a hydroacoustic uh, marine and mammal monitoring plan. Um, and so that's really looking at ambient noise levels as a result of construction and various other things and developing uh, plans to, to minimize those impacts on the animals uh, and to avoid that. Um, and it, it recognizes a number of potential steps that might be included in there, um, but that's a, a mitigation measure that would be developed with any new construction. 
Uh, it also recommends a soft start for, for construction when you're doing pile driving and things. So you kind of give a, a warning shot uh, with the pile driver, let it wait, let the animals disperse, and then you begin your work, um, supposing there's any better impact in the first place. Uh, also looks at options like a cushion block, which would soften the sounds and the, the vibrations of the pile driver, uh, as well as a bubble curtain that emits an underwater curtain of bubbles to mitigate noise. So they, they have a lot of different options. We've been working with the, uh, the various state and federal agencies for the past two years on, on just maintenance permits uh, for this type of work. Um, and what's proposed in the IR is very much aligned with what uh, those agencies have generally required uh, and, and have been you know, seeking uh, as we go forward on just maintenance. Um, and then uh, as far as the birds go, it recommends a pre-construction biological survey. So um, getting a, a biologist or out there to assess uh, where nests are uh, within the realm of uh, pro proposed construction projects. Um, if bird nests are found, um, one, avoiding them, um, you know, as long as possible, um, but setting a, a strict buffer around those birds. Uh, and I believe in the EIR, it's generally 100 to 150 feet from a nest, uh, depending upon species, uh, in order to assure that the nests go undisturbed. And that's in, in compliance with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, just a little example of what that kind of looks like. Um, this was a, the bird study that was done in 2017 about two different species of birds that are common on the wharf. Uh, if we were to look at those nesting sites and apply a 100-foot buffer, you can see what that would do uh, as far as, um, you know, restricting uh, maintenance and, and construction work on the wharf, um, which, you know, doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, we don't have the luxury of, of avoiding uh, pile driving and maintenance work out there. And so um, we have to be very very um, strategic around how this work is done to minimize impact on, on birds um, as we go forward. Um, similarly, uh, impacts to sea life. Uh, we mentioned the, the aesthetic impacts, uh, creating glare and lighting and things. Uh, the Wharf Master Plan would, would help buffer uh, and, and limit the, the ambient light leakage into the ocean mm -hmm. and, and from the structures, uh, both through the hooding and the design of the <coughs> um, Moving forward, we've got the, the geology and hydrology and, and water. Um, so the, the, there are certain CEQA thresholds for this, uh, which is largely about avoiding um, you know, loss of, of structures and life due to, to faults and, and earthquakes and seismic activity, uh, as well as uh, modifying drainage patterns in negative ways that impact rivers and streams and oceans, uh, and uh, minimizing any, um, any potential leakage or release of pollutants into things like the ocean. Um, and so in the IR, they identified some potential impacts from, from development. All are very incidental and would not be a, a necessarily, they would not necessarily occur with construction, but there's always a likelihood that you might have an, an equipment leak or uh, drop materials that fall in the water or, or a, you know, in, uncover some old materials that may be under the sand, that, like a, you know, we didn't find any, but say there was a car that drove off that was never dug out, uh, maybe it's got some oil that came out. So that, that's sort of stuff that could happen whenever you start stirring around. Um, we did do an underwater survey uh, with the magnetometers and scuba diving and did not find any significant structures um, or historical resources, um, but you just never know. And so the EIR was really trying to anticipate that and provide mitigation members, um, measures. Uh, so really what it recommends is, is creating a floating boom around construction to contain anything that might get out, uh, whether it's a piling or, you know, wrapping or whatever. Um, and uh, containing wherever vehicles and equipment are fueling, uh, keeping a, a containment on that so that if there's leakage that spills out, it spills into a, you know, a pan or, or a plastic sheeting or something. And then uh, mandating a, a work stoppage in the event that we do find any, um, any un, un, unintended leaks or, or, you know, dispersions of, of, of materials that shouldn't be there. Uh, and providing time for, for the city to consult with the Department of Toxic Substances, control, and, and find the right solution to that problem. Uh, the next uh, issue is transportation, traffic, and parking. So this was uh, the, the EIR studied uh, what the proposed improvements would do as far as potentially increasing traffic and parking demand um, to, uh, as a result of the Wharf Master Plan. Uh, these are the, the thresholds that have to be uh, met in order to actually create a significant uh, impact. 
Uh, where the wharf master plan doesn't substantially increase parking on the wharf, uh, it creates between 40 and 60 spaces by restriping the existing footprint of parking. Um, but they studied uh, existing and historic uh, traffic levels and parking levels on the wharf and determined that it wouldn't rise to the level of a uh, substantial impact. Uh, it also would result in increased emergency access versus uh, inadequate, uh, and it would encourage more sustainable transportation like biking and pedestrian use. Um, and then uh, as far as CEQA land use, so it, will the proposed land use changes on the wharf to increase the commercial or, or, or uh, community buildings, will those uh, conflict with existing land use plans or, or divide an established community? Um, in the literal sense, no. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, metaphorically, you might have a little bit of division between what people see at this point. Um, but really, the master plan, again, is about uh, creating opportunities for us to have those really meaty discussions about what we should build and why, um, and create those opportunities for us to sustain the work going forward. Um, and then it also requires, CEQA also requires us to study project alternatives. Um, so what are alternative uh, designs and things that might have a reduced uh, environmental impact? So the, uh, the no project alternative is always required by CEQA and two additional project uh, alternatives were proposed uh, in, in studying the IR. Uh, the first uh, reduced the width of, width of the East Promenade by about uh, 12 feet, uh, which would make it um, basically not usable for emergency access, um, but would reduce the extension of the wharf on that side. Um, and it would also recommend the, the reduced height to 40 feet versus 45 on the, those um, community buildings. Um, which is what staff ended up going with our recommendation, um, mainly because it aligned with the existing zoning and, it, you know, and previous public process in that regard. And then the last item was a modified project uh, which would eliminate the western walkway and again reduce the heights of the buildings to 40 feet. Okay. Uh, for more information on the Wharf Master Plan and in the documents you've seen today, um, you can go to the link right there. Um, it's also in the staff report. Um, there's virtually anything that's been studied on this project, as well as the master plan itself, the engineering report, all of that. Um, upcoming EIR dates, uh, I meant to change that to November 2020 is the likely council date. Uh, we haven't yet determined what date that would be. It's really contingent on, uh, you know, planning commission's feedback tonight. Uh, and then supposing that council uh, does eventually approve the master plan in some form, uh, there would be a 30-day challenge period after the CEQA is certified. And... All right, I'll leave it up to Planning Commission uh, questions. Thank you for uh, for bearing with me through all that. Okay, thank you very much for a very comprehensive presentation of the Wolf Master Plan and its EIR. Uh, we're going to start first with uh, questions from commissioners. Maybe you could uh, un share your screen, David, and... Um, oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. To commissioners, um, what I would suggest is you raise your hand. I think if, if there should be some, if there's something there that you can uh, click on that will show that your hand is raised, so just do it on the video. But uh, there are questions from commissioners before we throw it open to the public. Yes, Commissioner Spellman. Yeah, I just have a couple of quick questions. One, um, when this came before us back in 2016, I think one of the interesting components to the proposed improvements out there was dealing with the trash, and there was a whole system designed around that, and I thought there was a big tie-in between potential erosion and destruction of the surface of the wharf and that system, and I guess was that what's happened to that? Is that still a part of this? If you could answer that, it, it, and then... And my second question would be for the gentleman who is here uh, representing the wharf, who, who works for the city out at the wharf. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch his name at the beginning. I've got just John one Hunter. general question for him that would be, you know, as somebody who's out there every day, what is your big concern regarding the long-term viability of the wharf? David, do you want to go ahead? I'll go ahead and answer the first question, and then I'll, I'll uh, leave it to John Babachi uh, to, to really uh, highlight the second. So I didn't uh, – there's a bit of an oversight, uh, oversight as far as the trash collection and the, the stormwater collection. Those are, you know, key parts of the sustainability of the wharf. 
Um, however, they didn't really arise in the public comments, and I, I was running short on time, so I didn't get to put that in the presentation. Um, the master plan does call for uh, the potential for a, um, a pneumatic trash collection system that would centralize uh, trash collection into a system that would ship it uh, down towards the end of the wharf and off into an off-site uh, collection uh, center. Uh, we've had some discussions with a vendor that's created these in other places, namely the East Coast and Europe, um, and they've had discussions with the boardwalk about how feasible it would be for them as well to sort of consolidate trash collection in the entire beach area. Um, this would allow us to free up space on deck uh, that's currently for uh, trash compactors and, um, you know, an open waste bin and things like that that are really kind of degrade the experience on the wharf, um, although it's a, it's a substantial uh, capital improvement uh, that would need to be figured out. Um, it's also discussions with Public Works and their refuse team about how it works for them um, and, and sort of studying and learning more about it. Um, so but it's something we're really excited about. Um, similarly, uh, stormwater collection would be consolidated into a central, um, a central uh, drainage and treatment um, channels. Uh, so that we'd have less runoff ending up in the in the ocean, less uh, debris getting washed off the deck, um, and, and along those lines, uh, staff has already implemented a number of changes to try and reduce uh, debris and, and trash getting into the ocean. So John's team has been, um, if you've been out there recently, along the the railings, they've been installing uh, mesh along the bottom uh, lengths of them, so that windblown trash and stuff will get caught on deck rather than ending up in the ocean. Uh, similarly, the, the city's carbon or climate adaptation fund uh, supported uh, a pilot project uh, that we're looking to bring forward uh, with one of our one or two of our, our, our existing businesses uh, to test out a, a point source um, aerobic digester system. So it's kind of a next phase garbage digester or garbage disposal um, that takes organic waste and it dissolves it down using natural enzymes and, and processes uh, and a very small amount of water, it basically dissolves uh, food waste down into particles uh, less than half a millimeter in size uh -huh. that can then be flushed down the drain to the uh, wastewater treatment facility and, and dealt with as any other organic waste. Uh, so again, that will reduce um, the presence of, of organic material on the wharf, it'll reduce potential workforce injuries, and it'll make us a more sustainable um, uh, operation because we'll have to truck off all that stuff. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Bombacci, could you want to answer the second question, please? Uh, um, could you please re repeat what, what are the things that concern me the most day-to-day uh, -day out on the wharf? Um, there are a few things, uh, the first of, of which is that uh, we're getting a lot of corrosion in our fasteners on the wharf a lot of corrosion that's also causing um, uh, the joists to open up on top and exposing them to uh, wood fungus. And the danger in this is that the wharf continues to look really solid and the piles are in good shape, but that doesn't mean that the wharf is in great shape. Uh, what the decking does is it serves as a shear panel and it, it sort of uh, contains the movement of the wharf in big events, big storm events. Um, when you lose that, you can start to get uh, independent movement in large areas of the wharf, and, and, and the damage can compound really quickly and become much more expensive to fix. Uh, the other concern that I have is that um, we're really not accommodating the number of people that, that want to visit the wharf in, in the summer. Um, we've got this wonderful rail trail that, uh, that is being built, uh, the first section in the west side, that's going to uh, terminate actually right there at the base of the wharf. Well, it won't terminate, but that first section will. Um, and this is going to uh, provide a lot of opportunity for bicycle traffic and I think this is really a, a, a real saving grace uh, for the economy of the wharf, uh, which, which brings another concern that sustainability um, in the ocean really means being able to uh, uh, grow and, 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 and move with, uh, with time. And if you can't pay for yourself, if, if you can't pay the bills, you, you don't live, whether it's, uh, whether it's biologically 
economically. And so um, we need to grow. We need to grow to uh, accommodate the neighborhood that's grown up around us. Really, uh, we haven't done anything substantial on the on the war for almost 40 years. Meanwhile, the, our neighborhood has grown substantially. The the East Walkway um, or the East Promenade here really. Uh, uh, goes to a lot of these issues and that it does provide room. The width of it provides additional stability for the wharf. It represents a good grant opportunity because it's a, it's a public access feature and an emergency access feature. And uh, the width will provide a lot of stability for the wharf. And when we tie the, this new section into the old section, a lot of the decking that really needs to be repaired there will be addressed. And so um, that and the other thing that um, I've, I've always, one of the things that has really disappointed me over my time at the wharf is that we lost our charter business and, and we lost uh, uh, fishing vessels dropping fish off at the wharf. And I just think that's really critical to the heritage of the wharf to get those things back. That's what a wharf is. We're, our tagline is that we're the gateway to the Monterey Bay. And to truly be that, we need to bring back those businesses. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions, Commissioner Spellman? That's it, thank you. Appreciate that. Other commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Dawson, uh, you're muted, so go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. I just had a question around uh, the aesthetic um, evaluation. So the the photo simulations were looking in, um, and, and I didn't see any, any photo simulations um, based on being actually on the wharf looking out and around and how the development would affect those. Did I miss that, or was that not included in the analysis? I'm not sure if that was in the, if that was done. Uh, I'm going to defer to Stephanie Strello on that. Um, she may know why or why why it was done or, or if it was done, um, and or if not. Stephanie. Yes. Good evening. Um, the standards, the thresholds for significance for aesthetics impacts, really look at whether or not a structure would block scenic views or disrupt the visual quality of the area. So we really focused on those views as opposed to views looking out. I'm not sure um, what features of the wharf um, would be significant from the wharf. We did respond to a comment that's in the final EIR and looked at um, from the end of the wharf. And from the end of the wharf, you can't really see the beaches um, because of the existing development on the wharf. So we did look at that component, that aspect of it. Thank you. Commissioner Dawson, a, a follow-up? or No, I'll, I'll just save it for my comments. Thank you. Other commissioners have questions? Yes, Commissioner Nielsen. Um, so I have a question. I, I guess this is for David. Um, for the Western Walkway, it sounds to me like what you're, in terms of how you presented that, that it's primarily a structural element or, or, or a way to stop, I guess, debris from hitting the um, hitting the wharf pilings. Is that is that true? I mean, is that basically what it is? Is it it's meant to um, to be a wave break or or something like that? It's a multi-purpose. Uh, improvement. Um, it certainly is, is there to provide uh, greater access around the wharf and a better experience of, you know, the, the wharf structure itself, which is one of the historic elements. Um, but it's uh, also there as that buffer, right? So for the long-term sustainability and resilience of the wharf, having a buffer on the outside will <clears throat> reduce the likelihood of impacts to structures that are supporting buildings and, as a consequence, businesses and people uh, that are in the, those businesses. It'll reduce that vulnerability, but at the same time, it's, it's there to increase public access uh, around the wharf and our experience of various aspects of the wharf. 
Um, is that access in any way um, intended to be used for emergency access also? Or is that just is it just for pedestrian access? I don't think it's substantial enough for like an emergency vehicle. Uh, you know, certainly a lifeguard or, or um, you know, a firefighter or something might use it if they needed to. But I don't think it would. It, it's not of such size that it could be used for a vehicle of any sort. Okay. Um, and then you, you mentioned the um, the increased parking um, that is being generated through the plan. Um, and but what I also and I also read, I did. I, I'll make, I'm just. What I read was that there was um, there was no expansion um, for, of this master plan in terms of any car use. So um, basically, what you're saying is that added parking is happening solely through parking restriping. It's looking at uh, largely. It's looking at uh, one utilizing the the space that's freed up from uh, going to a more sustainable garbage collection system. Uh, so by removing those those uh, storage spaces. But it's also looking at creating more parallel, or not parallel, uh, perpendicular end-in parking versus the angled parking that's there today. It's a more efficient layout, apparently. Um, you know, I'm not a parking designer, but um, apparently they did the math and they got more space. Okay, but but there's no, but but the, the wharf is not in, in essence the wharf is not being expanded at all for not parking. In, not yeah. at all. Right. Okay. Um, I also I have a question. Um, this might be for the planning director. Um, this is it's kind of more of a process question. Um, so, as part of our materials that we received um, for this meeting, we re we got a letter that was addressed to us from the chair. So, I'm curious. In my seven years on on planning commission, I've I've never experienced that. So, I'm just curious. Is that a is that normal? I mean, is that is is that just part of a normal process? Um, thanks for asking that question, Commissioner Nielsen. Um, it is not, I would say, part of a normal process. Um, uh, Chair Schifrin had requested to do that as uh, part of last uh, meeting when this was continued, and um, when this was continued as part of last meeting, um, technically there could have been discussion as part of that. Um, and so, uh, given that there could have been discussion um, during that noticed public hearing, um, even though it was only planned for continuance, we uh, we did allow that uh, to move forward. Um, Chair Schifrin will attest to the uh, uh, to the fact that we've had discussions with our uh, city attorney about um, uh, his desire to present uh, letters to the commission. And the position that we and the city attorney have taken is that um, when uh, those letters are, if, if a letter is presented in advance, um, that can have the effect of precluding others um, from communicating with one another because it then becomes a series of communications in which everyone is aware of um, one commissioner's stance on an issue. And thus, we have uh, been reticent to allow for commissioner's comments to come out in advance of the hearings. Um, however, um, given this unique situation where there was a continuance, um, we, we did feel it was warranted at that time, given that you know, there could have been commission discussion. But you know, I do like to uh, take a cautious approach to the Brown Act, um, and um, I encourage you all to do the same. Um, and that is why at the last meeting when that uh, letter was released and we, we mentioned that it would be released, I encouraged each of you to not uh, communicate with one another in order to avoid any Brown Act issues. And, um, you know, we could get into that separately at a, at a, 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 different, a different discussion. There are some um, uh, um, intricacies to that evaluation um, that, um, you know, Commissioner, or excuse me, Chair Schifrin and the attorney and I spent, you know, an hour talking back and forth, and I spent an hour talking with the attorney about it before that. So, you know, given that that's not agendized, we can't get into a detailed conversation about that, but mm -hmm. I say that, um, that, you know, given those unique circumstances of it, of it being heard at the last meeting and, and when commission discussion could have actually occurred at that last meeting, given that it was a notice item, um, we we felt it warranted to go ahead and release it at that time. Okay, thank you for your explanation. You're welcome. Uh, my questions are done. Thank you. 
Well, let me respond to that if I could. Um, one of the frustrations that I've always had on, when I sit, not, sit on a public body is getting information at the meeting. Uh, it's sort of it's hard to think about um, you know what you want to do when you're looking at the written information and you're trying to deal with public testimony and you're trying to respond to concerns that other commissioners have or that you have. And so from my perspective, it's helpful um, for commissioners to be able to do what every other members of the public can do, which is make their thoughts known in advance of the meeting. As a planning director says, uh, the, our city attorney, unlike uh, other uh, councils, um, take a very strict view and the planning director take a very strict view of um, the Brown Act. Um, you know, so I think it, it's, while it's unusual, um, I think I would benefit from hearing some of the concerns that um, the other commissioners would have on staff reports um, before the meeting so I could think about them rather than having to deal with them at the meeting and maybe continue, continue the item. So it's strange to me that commissioners are essentially uh, less able to present their uh, perspectives in a thoughtful way than members of the public. But as the planning director said, that's not on our agenda tonight, so it's not worth pursuing. But um, I just wanted to give a sense of what my, you know, what my concerns are. So other commissioners have questions. I have a few questions myself. I wanted to uh, talk about the height. Um, the height issue is one. My understanding from the draft EIR that the current height. I don't know if it's average height or maximum height is 27 feet. Is that correct? Uh, that's my understanding, um, you know, probably based on the plan uh, for those buildings. You know, okay. things aren't always built exactly to plan, but... And is it true that the historic warehouse building was only 30 feet high? It was about 30 feet high, yeah, at its highest. The proposed landmark building originally was going to be significantly higher than um, the historic building, as currently recommended by staff, it's still significantly higher, 10, you know, 25 percent higher, and it's definitely higher than the existing um, average height or maximum height. So, is that am I understanding that correctly? Uh, that's correct, and there's a couple reasons for it. Um, again, the, the designer's intent was to create a, a focal element that would uh, sort of Amidst the, the grandeur uh, of days past in relation to the now larger built form on the wharf. So where Stagnaro is now a two-story building and larger, in order to stand out against it, the designer said, hey, we need a, you know, a substantially larger building. Uh, it also, the larger envelope it's provides the interior space height while allowing the, the needs to evolve based on what the community would want if there was a second floor, perhaps, that was wanted. Okay, let me um, clarify the, what actually is happening with approval of the master plan. Um, you talked about it essentially being a framework and guidance, um, but it does have a legal, uh, uh, a, a legal status as well. Am I not correct that essentially if the city would want to do a project that was substantially different from what's in the master plan, it would have to redo the environmental document. Is that not the case? Not necessarily the entire environmental document, but they would have to amend it or tear off of it if they were to vary from it substantially. Uh, similarly, um, where almost every improvement proposed in the master plan is only at a program level, um, the exception being the gateway structure, uh, not the signage and the, uh, the East Promenade, which are project level under the CEQA uh, EIR. Uh, any, anything else proposed in the master plan will need additional environmental review once it advances to a higher level of design. But in, so, I'm glad you mentioned that because it didn't come out in your presentation. Um, am I correct that for those two project level, uh, uh, those two project level analyses, there is no, uh, as long as they adhere to what's in the draft EIR and the master plan, there is no uh, additional environmental review that they'll have to uh, be subjected to. That's the gateway That's building. Not, Stop and promenade. The, yeah, not the gateway building, the, the entrance gate. 
Um, but yeah, there's no, that's not exactly true. Um, at the local level, there's no further CEQA necessarily involved in them, unless they change substantially from what's proposed. Um, but there's still very significant environmental review and regulatory processes for any improvements on the ocean. So we'll be working with, uh, with NOAA, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the, um, uh, was it NIMPS, the National, or, John, you remember the, what that abbreviation is? I always forget it. National Marine um, Fishery Service, National Marine yeah, Fishery. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, there's, there's a half dozen state and federal agencies that we still have to work through, um, all subject to potential um, comment and, and public engagement or public feedback and appeal uh, before we can even hope to break ground on a project. So that's an yeah, so that raises an interesting question because one of the strengths I saw in the uh, EIR and in the, um, the analysis was that there weren't any negative comments or critical comments from these regulatory agencies. And I, I really think the staff should be complimented for working as closely with them as you have, because I know it, with other projects, they can be tough uh, in terms of um, criticizing what the city is proposing to do in, in a particular project. So I think um, it's, a, it's a little surprising what you're saying is that I would have assumed that as part of the EIR here, uh, a lot of the concerns, if not the significant concerns, of those agencies have already been taken care of, so that the city could be, uh, based on adoption of the master plan and the EIR, the city can move forward and implement these projects. Uh, I know there is there's going to be more sub uh, review, uh, and but uh, you know, isn't it true that the mitigations that are in the EIR? are considered adequate uh, by these agencies uh, in terms of the particular projects that uh, are project, project level? Uh, well, I'd say the, the jury's still out on that. I, I'd say that they are generally consistent with what they've required in the past um, and what they generally want. Um, as I mentioned, we've been in, in close negotiations with many of these agencies for two years now just trying to get maintenance permits. Um, while spending handily on emergency permits uh, to drive a few piles. So um, while we're still trying to figure out what the regulations will be for any improvements in the, the master plan, which we haven't really begun, um, what's in the mitigation here is very in line with what they require for, for the sort of maintenance work and the things that um, are similar to that sort of improvement. Well, my, let me just say, in my experience, the regulatory agencies look over these documents very, very carefully. And if the CEQA document is saying this is a project uh, level analysis for the gateway and for, for the entrance and for the Eastern Promenade, if they had problems with the mitigations or the analysis, they would have said so. So don't, I, I don't think you should underestimate the success that you that this process rep represents in terms of the willingness of the, uh, the regulatory agencies to uh, not be you know be essentially supportive of the, uh, the EIR's analysis um, I, I certainly hope so and uh, fingers crossed uh, we've got a great team uh, between Dudek uh, John and, and our engineers at Moffat and Nickel so hopefully uh, Hopefully you're right, and we've done it all, you know, right. I, I think we've got a great team on it. Well, I just, uh, I just want to emphasize it because, you know, the, the, if the council adopts the master plan, they are setting certain boundaries in terms of what can and can't be done during the future of the, at the future of the mall. If the, if the uh, council ultimately agrees with the Star Preservation Commission and sets the height at 35 feet, that's as high as it's going to be possible to go. Um, and that's, you know, th so these decisions are not simply a framework or guidance. They are setting policies that um, will need to be followed. Um, and so I just think it's uh, important to recognize that the city is making a commitment to this plan by adopting, it, adopting the EIR. My final question is really for... Uh, Ms. Strelo, and it's based on a letter we received from the Sierra Club 
regarding the on biological analysis, and I wonder if you've seen that letter and could comment on their concern, um, which I had a hard time understanding, but it seemed to be that the, the biologist cited or the biologist uh, statement cited in the fi fi final EIR wasn't adequate because it wasn't uh, clear who the person was and um, what the evidence was. Could you respond to that, please? Um, was this the letter that came in after the final EIR? Yes. I have not seen that. Maybe um, Dave can email it to me right now and I can get back to you on that. Well, I would just say that, you know, we're making a recommendation to the council. I, I would uh, suggest that when the, uh, the plan gets to the council, maybe there be some kind of a written response to it, uh, since it is challenging the environmental document. Okay. I, I will just say quickly, there were five biologists that worked on the different um, pieces of both the draft and final EIR. Right. Yeah, I might ask uh, Tess uh, or Lee, I'm not sure if I have that exact letter, so Tess, if she might be able to, to send that over uh, to Stephanie. Um, I'm just trying to find the right one. The, e the email was my It's posted to the website has... as well. It's oh, it's up on the website? Okay. So it's okay. posted to the item. Thank you. If there are no quite okay, Commissioner Nielsen. I, I do. I just um, I, I think um, some of um, the chair's questions. Um, I have a, a follow up to that, um, just based on the height, building height. So, based on um, the thresholds of significance, um, is building height specifically included as as one of those things, or is it, um, or does it more have to do with the potential obstruction of scenic views? I think I defer to Stephanie on that, but my understanding is it's, it's largely the, the scenic views and somewhat subjective. Yes, it's mostly um, obstruction of the scenic views, although one of the standards does look at um, visual compatibility in an urban setting that is also tied to consistency with um, local regulations that address inequality and so we we did discuss that a little bit in the EIR with regards to um, height limits but there aren't really any specific regulations that address scenic quality um, specifically so uh, so with that I mean um, comparing I mean it's it, you, you can't draw there's no correlation of really drawing a, a you know comparison of the existing building to the proposed building height at 45 feet? Um, yes and no. I mean, the CEQA guidelines are kind of the basis for our standards of significance, and those were amended a couple of years ago. And so the question that formerly was in the guidelines that dealt with um, was basically whether a project would substantially degrade the scenic quality of the site or surrounding area and we would look at um, structures in terms of their overall massing, scale, height, um, to make that kind of um, determination. And that, that criteria has changed a little bit um, in the sense that it says in, in urbanized areas, it's whether or not the project would conflict with applicable zoning and other regulations governing scenic quality. So in the EIR, we, we actually did both. We looked at the overall um, massing and scale, scale of these new buildings in relation to the surrounding areas, as we would have under the former threshold, as well as discuss the, any conflict with regulations governing student quality. Okay. And... Um... So, it, so, so somewhat in a way, it's, I mean, from kind of what I'm hearing, it's kind of subjective. It is, it is subjective in terms of like, you know, what people, you know, as they look at those, as they look at the, um, the photo simulations, as, you know, what, what would be an appropriate height um, for those buildings is, it, it is subjective. Um, so I guess the other question I have is, 
Uh, is there a threshold in terms of, um, and a, you know, what is considered being what's considered obstructing a scenic view? Like, is there a way to? I mean, is there some sort of threshold that, that's placed in terms of how much of a view is being blocked, especially with these panoramic, pan, panoramic views? Um, um, there's a very, you know, obviously a very wide scenic view. Um, and so I just wonder if, is there some sort of threshold or criteria that, you know, that, you know if it gets beyond this certain percentage that, um, that it's considered, um, to be substantial? Uh, fortunately, there's not. Again, this, this is somewhat of a more subjective topic of all the topics we review in the EIR. The question, the threshold, uh, is whether or not a project would have a sub substantial adverse effect on the scenic vista. And so with that in mind, there's nothing in the local coastal plan or any of the city's plans or regulations that further define how much obstruction of an ocean view would be you know, more significant than others. So we tried to look at the whole of it, you know, the panoramic mm -hmm. views that are visible from the key spots and, you know, in the context of the background mountains and the ocean views and um, where these new buildings might be blocking something. and. I think we addressed that um, you know, clearly from the end of the work. There's going to be some blockage of view, but we still have mm -hmm. most of the ocean view available in that panoramic. Mm -hmm. just, uh, and, and likewise, okay. Stephanie, I, I think that the, the shoreline views from the end of the wharf are already somewhat blocked by the dolphin and, you know, the, the sea lion holes and the restrooms and things like that. So it's not like it's, it's entirely pristine views looking back from the wharf. Um, you know, it, of course, it changes, but you still have the circuit around the buildings that you could view from. Commissioner Nielsen, is you have a follow-up question? Yeah, I'm here. No, that's good. That, that answers my question. Thank you. Are there any other questions from commissioners? Uh, seeing none, let's open it up to uh, public comments. Um, how is this going to work? Um. Okay, so we have seven attendees on the line. Any member of the public that wishes to address the commission at this time, please press star nine. That will put you in the queue. Please do that now so that you're all lined up. When I call the, first, uh, the last four numbers of your phone number, you will be on live to speak with the commission. So again, please press star nine to indicate that you wish to address the commission. And let me just suggest that um, you, if you're willing, give your name and you'll have three minutes to provide your testimony. Okay, Chair, at this time, it appears that there's one person of the seven that have indicated that they wish to address the commission. So um, if you would like me to start, I can allow Number 2174 to address the commission. Okay, sounds good. They have to unmute themselves. Okay. Yep. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Gillian Greenside. The agenda report states that the city cannot apply for grants until the plan and EIR are approved. That is not accurate. The city secured an 850,000 grant from the Federal Department of Commerce without a plan and EIR. There are numerous grants available to restore and renovate historic structures, none of which require a plan or EIR. The agenda report gives the impression that the wharf is in poor shape, in their words, approaching a slow boil. I'm very pleased that at least this evening it is acknowledged that the engineering report showed that 91% of the pilings are in excellent or good shape. The, the concerns expressed by Mr. Bombacci are real, the corrosion and the joints and the roadway needs fixing. None of those important uh, renovations need this master plan or an EIR. By the way, and this was confirmed by the engineering report, 
the wharf was not damaged by the 1989 earthquake because of its flexibility. To shore it up as though flexibility is a problem should be of concern. And the wharf did not suffer damage from the tsunami. The agenda report states the wharf has been losing money for the past five out of six years. To make this claim, staff includes the cost of the lifeguards and marine rescue, both of which are funded by and fall under the fire department and should not factor into a discussion of wharf finances. With the EIR, the city's response to CEQA-based public comments failed to defend the city's position that this massive project beyond construction will have no or less than significant impacts. Just two examples. Pigeon guillemots fly each year from Puget Sound to their nesting sites under the wharf. While the city acknowledges that the lowered western walkway will likely significantly impact the birds' access from that side, the city claims the birds will still have access from the east and the south, and that because the wharf will be increased by 33%, that habitat under the wharf will be similarly increased. There is no statement nor supporting document from the biologist to support this claim. The only work the biologist did was to count the number of species and locate the nests. The EIR fails to respond to the public comment that the lower deck to the south, the new boat landings, outriggers and associated visitors to the east will likely deter the birds from those vantage points as well and thus is a significant impact that requires mitigation. Beyond Gila, if I could just finish my, my sentence here. Beyond Guillemots, the impact of the lowered western walkway is dismissed as not significant in the EIR, which fails to follow Secretary of the Interior standards for guiding construction. How will sea lions and nesting birds adapt to this lower walkway with hundreds of people entering their territory? What loss to the public of the snowy egrets that perch on the west side railings? What loss to the historical character of the wharf? In conclusion, this EIR is not legally defensible. Your motion this evening should be to send it back for revision prior to City Council deliberation. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that press star nine? I uh, don't see that anyone. Oh, there's one. Okay, so there's one, and there are more of you on the line. So please, all of you who wish to speak, please press star nine now so that we don't have unnecessary confusion and delay. Um, there's one hand, and this is last four numbers, 6766, which I'm allowing to speak now. Hey, welcome. Please uh, give us your name, and you have three minutes. Hello. Uh, Fred Geiger here. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, there's about four things I'm hoping the commission will look into on this uh, situation. Uh, so there's some things that are just really silly and, and not really what we want as a result for the benefit of the community. Uh, the first one is the, the Sea Life Viewing Port. Uh, you know, these cost the city nothing. They cost our visitors nothing. They're a link for people to, in their mind, come to Santa Cruz and see some nature and have a nice time and you know experience some of what Santa Cruz has to offer. Uh, just covering them over would just be silly. I mean, what's the point? <laughs> like I said, they don't even cost anything. So number one, I hope you'll certainly act on that. Uh, a second thing that I think is troubling and misdirected is the walkways down lower uh, towards the ocean. We know in 1979, I believe, the Capitola Wharf, two buildings on the end were completely destroyed by waves. We know now that with global warming, we're having higher seas and bigger storms. That walkway down there is subject to these weather events. If it comes loose, you have these huge pieces of uh, wood smashing into the pier, to the pilings of the pier. Uh, it, that, if no one's there to, to get killed, uh, it would just be pier damage. But that's certainly something that, that is not wise planning to uh, create a situation where the pier could suffer severe damage. Uh, another issue I hope you'll look into is the um, non-cruise ship landings. We keep being assured these giant uh, landings are not for cruise ships. But well, what are they for? Uh, 
you know, they said they're for what marine uh, research vessels. Well, which what marine research vessels? Nambari has their own place. Uh, Monterey Aquarium has their own place. I don't think it's in the interest of Santa Cruz to have thousands of people, literally, or the environment of Santa Cruz, charging down the wharf. Uh, certain business community members might like that. I don't think that would uh, create an attractive wharf for any other uh, potential visitors or customers. So let's get rid of these these uh, landings that aren't for cruise ships but don't seem to be for anything else. We're getting assurances from the staff that they're not. But we also were told by the manager of the wharf at the original EIR hearing that cruise ships couldn't enter the marine sanctuary, which we found out is completely untrue. They do and can come to Monterey. They have dumped raw sewage just a couple hundred yards off of the uh, harbor in Monterey, and they uh, pollute the air drastically with unregulated uh, diesel emissions. So let's make sure they can't come if they're being we're being told they're not going to well if they're not going to why do we have to have planning <laughs> that allows them to later that's double talk and as is the grandeur of the buildings that are oversized and not in harmony with the uh, environment and the uh, ambiance of the wharf if we're not going to build big buildings let's say we can't build big buildings <laughs> i don't think people come to santa cruz to admire the grandeur of overly large structures that's not what santa cruz is about <laughs> So let's put it in writing, a reasonable limit that's in harmony with what we have on the wharf already, and so that it gets uh, changed and ignored later on down the road. So I hope you look at these four points and uh, make sure that we're not going to get led down the path that that's going to have some really deleterious effects on the wharf and on the businesses and on tourism and on the residents of Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody else have their hand up? Not at this time. This would be the, oh, there's one. <laughs> Could everyone who's waiting to speak to the commission please press star nine now? Uh, I'm to get the feedback at a regular public meeting that people wait until. Uh, for the dramatic the finish, right? <laughs> ah, we have two now. Um, the next speaker uh, actually has his name, uh, Charles Meyer. Okay, um, you have up to three minutes. Oh, thank you. I just, I'll be pretty brief. I just, uh, my name is Charles Meyer. I'm a, a, a tenant on the wharf, and I just wanted to say that I support the the um, project and um, think it would be positive for the community overall, and um, as well as uh, having some flexibility to design a, a great destination at the end of the wharf would be excellent. And um, it is a place where people come and have been coming for generations and generations, and to create uh, a little more growth and a little bit more um, newness and freshness there would be wonderful. That's all I'd say. I think you should support it. Thank you. Okay, there is another speaker on the line. Uh, last four numbers, 0665. Welcome. Uh, please introduce yourself, and you have up to three minutes. And you need to unmute. Star six, unmute. Yes. Yeah, I think. There you go. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're ready to. Well, thank you. Uh, this is Carmela Weintraub, and um, I have uh, been interested in this pro uh, project for a long time, and I have to be honest about it. It's been a hard, to uh, hard thing to wade through all the material that, uh, and, and ups and downs uh, and ins and outs of this for such a long period of time, and I lost kind of lost track of it at some point. But recently, I talked to Dave McCorm McCormick and had a really nice conversation about the project, and basically, I support it, and I'm happy that it's happening, and I also have some issues. So um, I'm going to refer to the, um, the document, the only document that I could actually find, because Dave said that the original one was 500 pages. So I, got, I only got to the final copy of the EIR uh, plan, which I think is 200 pages, and I have to say I read every single page. And then I was really confused. <laughs> so 
a lot of material. So here I am asking now for a more specific consideration on the uh, aesthetics part of this plan regarding the destination landmark building that will, as far as I'm concerned, be too far high and will cover much too much of the war square footage. Um, I feel kind of like the wharf itself is a destination, and um, there, there are many people that feel like this building is out of scale for the rest of the wharf buildings, and that it will dominate the landscape of the ocean, but it will also dominate the landscape of the actual wharf itself. Um, many of the letters from citizens reflected the lack of support for this building um, because it's too large and too dominant. Why put this into the plan if it seems like the, the Coastal Commission also has issue with the lack of consistent scale? So the response notes, in their notes, uh, their comments um, that um, um, Mr. McCormick made uh, when they sent their letter to him, that um, it is being included in the plan for a possible future development that does not guarantee that it will actually not be developed and become an eyesore, taking up valuable open space that people have come to the wharf for. I dare say people generally do not come to the wharf to be enclosed in a large warehouse. They can go to Costco for that. Um, I feel the Planning Commission should respect the opinion of the residents of Santa Cruz and not put this in if it actually seems to be um, part of the project that a lot of people aren't happy with. It is, um, I was shocked when I saw the elevations. I couldn't find them anywhere online, so I just saw them tonight. And I have to say, I was visibly shocked to see how, how big it is and how much of the uh, footprint it covers. So I want to also say something about the infill um, possibilities of the wharf, that we're not building a city on the wharf. We're, we're trying to keep a low-slung um, building the way it has been so that the, um, the natural features of the ocean are the, the um, focus and not a lot of buildings, although I do totally support the fact that this, this um, this wharf is also a shopping area and it's also a restaurant area. So I love the fact that it has commercial purpose. I, and I think that that destination building should be turned into more commercial space if that's our goal with lower um, height and more variety and not such a huge dominant uh, la uh, landscape object. I, I, I'm just feeling very strong. So again, I do support the improvements that need to be made to the wharf, and I look forward to future opportunities for public input. I know these are required, but they need to be listened to, responded to, and generally taken into consideration, partly because I've seen too many instances in Santa Cruz where the city council takes the plan and just runs with it, no matter what the citizens have to say about it. And I know aesthetics are subjective, but I also know a lot of people don't like the size and scope of that one building. So thank you very much for listening to me and thank you to all of you for being so patient tonight to go through this in such great detail. I do definitely appreciate your work. I also appreciate all the work that went into the to this plan, the EIR plan itself was is a very good document. So thank you. I'm going to stop. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak to the commission? I don't see any raised hands. If there's anyone of you six that wish to address the commission, now is the time to press star nine. And I've got nothing. Okay, um, based on that, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring the matter back to the commission for uh, comments first and then action. Uh, with Commissioner Nielsen? 
I, I actually, before I have comments, I actually have a couple questions, a couple more questions, um, just based on some public testimony. Um, the this is for um, this is for David. Um, so, for the other for for the existing commercial buildings that are on the wharf, what is the what's the maximum um, height that's allowed currently? I think it's under the existing zoning of 40 feet, um, but Lee could probably confirm that. Yes, I believe that's accurate. And then, uh, so the existing zoning allows 40 feet, and then um, you know there are uh, there's an ability to um, go higher through separate processes, either through a PD or I believe uh, that the zoning also allows like certain architectural projections above that. Um, you know, minor, minor things. So, um, <clears throat> or if a, if a, if one of the existing commercial buildings were to um, be built, does it does that need to go through a public process, or is that is that already just covered within the zoning, and they can build it up to the 40 foot height? So, uh, two things I would say to that. Um, they could go up to the 40-foot height, and um, they could um, go through an administrative review process that would not trigger a public hearing. Um, however, um, are a, a new building of, of any substantial size um, would likely trigger a community meeting under um, our uh, roughly two-year-old now uh, council policy on community outreach. And so there may be a community meeting and there may not be a public hearing. Um, I will say this was a point of uh, discussion last night as part of the Historic Preservation Commission's uh, deliberations with respect to um, what uh, items are referred to them and go through a historic alteration permit. And there are, are different perspectives uh, surrounding that um, in relation to um, whether the, uh, the wharf itself is a historic site or whether it's just a structure. Um, and there was you know, probably uh, 45 minutes of discussion about that last night. So I don't know that we need to rehash all of that. But suffice to say that you know, there could be a historic alteration permit. Um, there would likely be uh, at least a community meeting um, and um, if they wanted to go higher through uh, plan development, for example, then that would certainly trigger a, a public hearing. So, uh, long answer to a short question. Okay, but higher, when, you, when you say higher, you mean higher than the 40 foot? Higher than the 40 feet. Um, you can use a plan development permit to go higher than 40 feet, um, and um, that would trigger a public hearing. Um, that would also have its own CEQA analysis associated with it, and we would be evaluating um, that for okay. uh, heights. It, you know, this is, again, absent the, the current <coughs> We'd be evaluating that for aesthetic impacts and so forth associated with height. Okay, yeah, thank you. I would reiterate with that that, again, part of the impetus between the Coastal Commission and our own internal process is for updating the master plan because what the old master plan in effect now is calling for may not be what the community really wants. Okay. Uh, but it, but this but this master plan is not calling for those for those building heights to be uh, to be lower. Like the existing for uh, well I, I guess that's the question. is or is the, I don't I don't recall seeing in this master plan that they that there was any discussion around the 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 commercial buildings Aside from the three new buildings that are being proposed, would be brought down to a lower height. It calls for a 35 foot maximum on the other ones. Oh, it does. Okay. Yeah, some I, of the design. Maybe I missed. Okay, I guess I missed that. Okay, so so basically, based on this, um, okay, so based on this um, master plan, then 35 foot would be the maximum for the commercial building, and staff. Currently, right now, is supporting a 40-foot high limit for the three other buildings. Correct. Okay. Okay. So I have um, one additional um, question. Um, 
if regarding I could chime Midwest? In, sorry, and, and just to, oh, yeah. to sorry, uh, I want to give you a complete response on that because um, I also want to verify here. I believe that um, this, and Dave, you may know off the top of your head, I'm, I'm sorry, I was trying to scroll here onto um, our GIS. Um, is this part of the uh, uh, Coastal Commission's original permit jurisdiction? Therefore, uh, coastal, yeah, coastal, 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 coastal Commission through the Coastal Commission? Yeah, I think because it's on top of the water, they have ultimate jurisdiction. Right. So the the uh, other answer to that question, sorry, I was, I was referring to our permits, but the Coastal Commission would do a permit uh, as well for that, oh. um, for the... Uh, for oh. the coastal development permit. Sorry, I left that out originally. And yeah, okay, that, so that would happen regardless, right, for, for any new structure on the wharf. Yeah, and I, I'm going to verify that as I uh, pull up the GIS here, but um, I, I will leave it there, and if I don't come back and correct myself, that is the response. <laughs> let, me, <laughs> okay. let me get to the GIS. Say, that's been our, our experience in discussions with them. Okay, great. They, Thank you. They view that as, as their territory, our, our coastal program does not apply ahead of theirs. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what I would expect. I wanted to verify and realize I left Okay. Out. Understood. Um, then the, the other question I have uh, goes back to the Western Walkway um, question. Um, in terms of the um, setting these, the, the lower walkway with, the, with, the, with this additional set of pilings that are, are there to protect the wharf, is this a technique uh, that has been used elsewhere um, that you know of, like in terms of um, setting pilings out to protect the wharf, but also creating a lower walkway um, in addition to that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt that to John. I, I can think anecdotally that I've seen it in some places, not in a, a structure of the scale. Uh, but John had a good answer about how, uh, you know, other wharf masters and stuff view our wharf. Okay. Yeah, a lot of other wharfs view our wharf as we're the big dog in the state. They look to us for answers. They have a lot of confidence in what we do. Uh, but I will say this, that, that uh, <laughs> guard piles, fender piles, however you want to describe dolphins as well. We have three piles driven together, a rope around them, or some sort of containment at the top. These are all very common um, structures around, around wharves. And so mm -hmm. um, it's something that's commonly done. To incorporate a walkway, uh, you, we've certainly seen it in, in, in waterfronts. Um, it's, it's not there particularly uh, to protect the wharf. It's just often to bring a, a, a walkway down closer to the water. But um, the, it generally, we like to look for the two first and three first uh, when it comes to doing a structure, and, and this accomplishes several things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to follow up on your question um, to just clarify. If the uh, uh, council supports the HPC recommendation for 35 foot height limit for all the buildings, um, does that become the standard? Um, and essentially, adopting the wharf master plan is adopting, as I understand it, the general plan for the wharf. And so, if the decision is to have a 35 foot height limit, that becomes the, the requirement. Is that not the case? Or is that the I think, case? Punch, I think I'd punch Lee on that, but uh, uh, typically, uh, you know, you'd have to bring the zoning in line with it, and it would have to be incorporated into the master plan or the general plan. But I'll let Lee speak to that. What I would say to that is, um, you know, it's it's a council policy document, and if we're bringing something forward, it needs to be consistent with the council adopted council policies, unless it's accompanied by a modification to that. So if the council, you know. Ideally, we would have it, um, it, we would have our zoning consistent with that, um, it, but if there's something in the master plan that's uh, deviating from that and, and more restrictive, then um, we would look to have project compliance with that more restrictive standard. Okay, thank you. 
Other commissioners have uh, comments? Yes, Commissioner Greenberg. You seem to be muted. You're still muted. You can't be heard, uh, Commissioner Greenberg. We can't hear you. It must be her phone. Um, we cannot hear you. I'm so sorry. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thanks. So this is again a question about the lowered walkway, and the degree to which, following up on the public comments, the issue of sea level rise in relation to this, and whether this has been studied and perhaps in, in coordination at all with the Resilient Coast Initiative um, happening um, along, you know, West Cliff and, um, and the boardwalk area. That's my first question. And the second question was about another question from the public around um, sea life viewing and the reasons for which they're couldn't be similar opportunities for people to look down and view sea life within the wharf in the way that it had been done, and whether um, conceivably that could be built into or maintained within the structure of a, of a building that would go on the end of the wharf. Those are my two questions. Thanks. Yeah, John, you look like you, look like you were prepared for the sea level rise one. Um, Yes, that was all. That was all looked at, and we are compliant with the uh, with the in our coastal planning. Um, we've done all of the sea li uh, sea level rise calculations, and um, our plan is 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 well supported. Uh, with regards to the to the sea lion viewing areas, which were originally developed as fishing accesses uh, and in the old fishing park on the end of the wharf. Uh, those have been moved many times over the years, and we've, we've maintained them. And there's no reason to expect that we couldn't maintain them uh, whether we built the landmark building or not. The landmark building was originally, when it was in the master plan, took, sort of took into account that the dolphin would still be there. Um, the underpinnings of the dolphin are such now that Perhaps or perhaps not, there's, there would be an opportunity to incorporate that business into the building. Uh, there, there's a lot of things that could happen there. Um, but you could certainly maintain the, the viewing ports if, if, if everybody feels like that's a really important. Yeah, you could, you could definitely do that. Yeah, I, I would just add to those two things. Uh, sea, sea level rise is evaluated in the engineering report, um, as well as changing weather conditions, I believe, uh, and in the, the CEQA document under the hydrology section. Um, as far as the sea life viewing, if you look at staff's recommendation, I think item six uh, is a commitment to either preserve or relocate uh, to an equal or, or better location, uh, those, those viewing ports. I think the, the widening of the end of the wharf, uh, as well as potential changes to how it's laid out with buildings that are there or could potentially be there in the future, gives us a lot of opportunity to find key locations for that. Um, but we're committed to preserving that element. Um, people seem to love it. Um, I know I love it. It's fun to go to. So why get rid of what's not broken? Other comments or questions by commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Dawson? Uh, thank you for the report. Um, I just wanted to kind of go over three general areas um, that I'm really thinking about. Um, not surprisingly, the height is one of those. Um, it's, uh, you know, also hearing from the Historic Preservation Commission that um, 35 feet is their recommendation. Although the zoning does allow up to 40 feet, it says in the report that the average is 27 feet. So the increase that the staff is um, supporting is significant. I mean, 40 feet versus 27 feet is pretty significant. So I'm much more supportive of something um, just uh, for all the buildings at 35 foot limit um, to be in line with the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, 
the aesthetic analysis in CEQA, um, there's been some discussion about the subjectivity of that, um, but I think there's just basic logic as well that goes along with those analyses. Um, and the footprint shown in the photo simulations um, certainly, to me, appears significant. And another part of the aesthetics that wasn't analyzed and I think needs to be part of this discussion, and I hope that my fellow commissioners would also take this under consideration, is um, I think one of the commenters actually brought it up that, that the ocean is uh, part of the experience of the wharf. And the fact that there's no analysis of what it's going to be like to stand on the wharf and how that's going to change um, as the footprint of the buildings change. I'm very supportive of the walkways. Um, I do have some concerns about putting people closer and closer to the sea lions because um, although they are used to having people around um, that, that could change their behavior, getting people closer down to them. Um, but generally speaking, I think improving access to the wharf, allowing people to go out makes a lot of sense. Um, but the, the building footprints I have really con I have real concerns about, and um, I, I think it's really going to affect that feeling you have when you stand on the wharf of, I've been on a lot of boats in my life for work, and you really feel like you're kind of on a boat except the lack of the movement. Um, you're really surrounded by the ocean. You're surrounded by um, the birds and the sea life. And then the viewing ports also allow people to kind of get a feeling and see the sea stars and the muscles on the islands. And so I think that that's something that we need to think about maintaining. And the landmark building, I think, really is going to prevent that. Um, and, and using the reasoning of there used to be a warehouse to store things out on the edge of the wharf for a reason to rebuild something that large, to me, also doesn't stand up from a CEQA standpoint. So I have real concerns that the CEQA um, uh, analysis and the EIR is not going to stand up with the aesthetic findings and that there are significant impacts that um, need to be considered. Um, I'm much more supportive of 35-foot height. Um, and I, I really don't think we need the landmark building at all, and that would be a way to move this plan forward. Um, we really do need to move it forward, and we could remove the landmark building as part of this um, and change the design standards to 35 feet and possibly continue to move this forward. Um, and I'll leave it there for now. Other commissioners have comments? Uh, I've got uh, – Commissioner Spellman, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I do want to, um, you know, thank the public and their comments for this process. This is a very complicated issue. Uh, anybody that's delved into these documents and really dug in and started to understand them realizes that, you know, there's there's a ton of work here, a ton of questions and opportunities, uh, all couched in, you know, how do we save this precious resource that we have? Um, so. I think in the big picture for me, um, I would find it irresponsible if we can't find a way to approve the, a master plan and the EIR to support it. Um, I think there's been a lot of good discussion to add some fine tuning to the language to, um, let's say, protect people's uh, interests in, in seeing potentially less development out there. I'm in support of that idea. Um, I do think there are some problematic components to the overall layout uh, of, of the, let's call it, ultimate build-out, and I think it does relate back to uh, the experience of being on the wharf and how you engage, you know, with the ocean environment there. We've, you know, it's essentially a one-sided street, right, with open space to the south or to the east and buildings along the northern edge, and a pretty substantial row of buildings uninterrupted. Um, why don't we propose interrupting that experience so that you could actually engage with views of Cowles Beach and West Cliff and, and those elements getting down to the western uh, promenade, the lowered walkway. Um, I think more opportunities to actually experience being out in that ocean environment are uh, as important, if not more important, than um, just filling up the commercial space, so to speak. Um, 
So I, I think there's room in the plan to allow for that. Uh, I think it could be as simple as describing um, a, a motivation to increase that aesthetic um, experience for the wharf. Um, but I think there should be some language that, that does highlight that. Um, I did um, the Historic Preservation Commission's comments sort of resonated with me. It sounds like um, requiring the historic alteration permits is already in play, so I don't think that's a new item. Uh, I think putting concrete words to describe some sort of a wharf museum or historical communication component to the plan would, is, is an important one, and I think that's something that we should include. Um, I do also on the on the height issue. So 45 feet does seem substantial uh, given the footprint of the let's call it the destination project at the end of the wharf. Um, I, I can understand the motivations for wanting to, uh, in a in the large sense, place the biggest structure you know, at the end and have some differentiation between that and the rest of the buildings on the site. Um, but in this case where we're talking about, you know, the best view, the end of the wharf, the most potential to block, you know, views back and forth and sideways and everything else, it's already the destination. I don't think having the extra bulk and mass is necessarily going to, you know, put the cherry on top, so to speak. Um, I think a much more in scale, it's already the biggest building um, by itself out there. I think there's plenty that can happen in that and, and not have to be that big of a structure from a height standpoint. Um, I do want to recognize the public comment we had few speakers tonight, but there were many voices uh, in the comments for the EIR, as well as um, you know petitions that have circulated, et cetera. I don't think for myself, I have come to an understanding that the bird habitat, specifically the pigeon guillemots, hopefully I'm saying that right, has been vetted or that that answer, uh, that question has been answered um, by the EIR consultant tonight. So I think that for sure needs to be shored up. If it wasn't specifically addressed, I think that's a problem. Um, and then I want to thank, um, I think it was Fred Geiger who, you know, made some very astute, simple comments. He even called them silly. But of course we have to preserve uh, the sea life viewing portals, right? Whether they're where they are now or in another location, we need to include that in the master plan that they will be preserved in some location uh, moving forward. Um, I also have this, because we're starting to talk about not including cruise ships, I mean, I think it's obvious that we don't want to include cruise ships, but we haven't really specified what it is we do want to encourage or, or to uh, allow to, to engage with the war. So I think we need to do that. I think we need to have a, a little bit clearer understanding on, on what that is. I don't, I don't have an answer right now, but I do remember uh, 2016 when we talked about this, there was discussion about, you know, I don't know what the right term is, but shuttle sort of vessels that potentially could engage from the Monterey Bay Aquarium and, and the wharf. Um, I'm on the fence about that. I don't know that, I don't know that we're trying to create a destination for We've lost you, Commissioner Spellman, we can't hear you. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, my earbud died on me. Um, 
Sorry, I think I was, did you hear, I was on the point about which type of seagoing vessels we want to allow to come to the, to the wharf. Um, you know, this is a complicated question, right? What, what, what do we want to encourage? Um, I, it certainly resonates that having a, a viable, you know, fishing connection, local fishermen bringing you know, fish to sail on the wharf, to the restaurants. I mean, I think that's a no-brainer, and that's a very easy accommodation. Where where does it go beyond that? How far does it go beyond that? Um, I don't have an answer to that, but I think it's one that should have some clarity and, and some discussion around. Um, yeah, here's an opportunity. You know, and then I think, as others have said so far, there are many, I think, improvements from this master plan that are going to be immensely beneficial to the general public. Um, getting better circulation, getting surfaces that work for people walking out there, people biking out there, uh, the fishermen to engage and have, you know, places to sit and relax and, and do their thing out there, separate the vehicles out there and make that a more safe environment. Those are, you know, those are amazing opportunities. If, if we, as a community, uh, have the wherewithal to implement all of these things and um, do some of the innovative things like get rid of trash uh, in, a, in an ecological way, right? This could be a, you know, an example for, for many other places if, if we're able to do this right. So I think the, you know, the, the level of thought that's gone into this plan is is pretty remarkable and I think uh, commendable. Um, what else do I have? Yeah, and I'm, I'm in general conformance with the proposed staff changes uh, regarding, you know, toning down that entrance sign. Um, certainly sounds like that was a, a concept and not a design when it was presented and certainly we want to be able to um, sort of control and, and get the right people putting eyes on what the right solution is for that entry sign. Um, yeah, so that's, those, those are my thoughts tonight. Thank you. Other commissioners? Um, Commissioner Nielsen again. Um, so I, first off, I, uh, I do want to um, thank staff um, and um, all the consultants for a uh, very in-depth uh, master plan and support and all the supporting materials uh, it's this is obviously a very complex project um, that's out over the water so it makes it even that much more um, you know challenging um, and so I really appreciate um, how, how all these materials were put together, and it was, um, you know, it, it was it was in depth, and it was a lot to get through. But I, I did appreciate all the all the effort and the time that was put into it, and you know, throughout all the years. So um, I just wanted to thank everybody for that, as well as the as well as public um, input and public comment. It's always important. Um, to hear what, um, what the public has to say about these things because it is these are all things that are done for the public. So I'd like to thank the public uh, as well. Um, I am in support of the of this master plan, um, and uh, and with that, I'm glad actually that the uh, that the plan master plan from 1980 was not implemented. Um, I I don't think I'd ever seen that image before, um, but. Um, but that was that was quite a, a departure. Um, but so anyway, I, I I do like the one that we're that we're looking at right now. Um, I am uh, I'm in favor of what Commissioner Spellman uh, brought up in terms of the concept of breaking up that row of commercial buildings. Uh, that was that's an interesting thought. Um, it it uh, reminds me of discussions that we had uh, when we discussed the downtown plan in terms of how far. Um, do we want people to be walking before, you know, they have the, of these un, uninterrupted um, buildings before there's a place to be able to get through? And I think 
this idea of getting through to the to that western walkway is an interesting one. Um, so I, I, I would, I'd like to see something like that worked in if it, if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, the um, in terms of the uh, the landmark building, um, I'm not. I, I, I'm in favor of the landmark building. Uh, I don't want to see it removed um, from this master plan. Um, I am understanding of, um, of people's comments around the height of the building. Um, I'm, I'm in favor of the building being at the 40 foot height that staff um, has been recommending. Um, and the reason why is that I think if, if the rest of the buildings are, um, are um, allowed to be at a height of 35 feet, I think there does need to be some hierarchy uh, established among um, certain buildings. Um, now, I, I, so that, that's all to say, I also hear what, um, what Commissioner Sullivan said about that building kind of standing alone. So if it came down to it and, you know, we, you know, I could be persuaded to go down to 35 feet on that building. Um, and if it meant that we could still keep the building, I'm not interested in removing that building from this plan. Um, so uh, the, the, to me, in terms of the, um, the wharf master plan, the kind of the most important thing to me is, is that the wharf has the ability to get to to continue to live on and it can it, that it can continue to be used um i think that really is the most important part to me like there is um there in order to do this there's some substantial changes that need to happen to the work in order for it to be viable for the next hundred years and beyond that and um and it, you know a lot of those things um have to do with um you know the structure of it, and then it also has to do with the economic viability of the businesses. There's there's a lot of things that need to change, um, uh, and uh, from what the wharf is today. And I know that people really love the wharf the way it is, um, but in order for it to be viable and for it to be able to to go on, um, there are changes that need that need to happen. Um, and and you know, and a lot of them are, are in this master plan. And so, they, to me, the key benefits of this master plan, in my mind, are one that is providing the necessary re repairs and upgrades to maintain the wharf. Um, obviously, that, that that's uh, of utmost priority uh, for public um, for public safety and just for the you know the longevity of the wharf. Um, the, the second thing, creating a, the defined circulation um, path for the for biking and walking, the, and having that being separated from car traffic, um, that that to me that is one of the biggest moves um, on this on this plan that I think makes the most sense. Um, and the um, the section that that. Um, that David brought up that shows the entire cross section of the of the wharf really tells the entire story of what is happening um, with these changes in, in terms of the, you have the car circulation and that's buffered from this uh, biking and walking section where and then there's also this lower section for that, that's even separated from that for fishing um, and then on the other side you have the the western walkway. Um, and and everything in it, you know, it makes sense. Or, or well, I, in, the, I, in my mind, it makes sense. But it also has a purpose. Everything has its purpose for why it was done that way, or how it's why it's designed that way. And so I'm very, um, I'm just I'm I'm very excited to to see this, and I'm I'm excited to see this this move forward. Um, the uh, the other piece that that I that, that I think is really interesting is that that there's an increased uh, parking capacity that's happening without actually expanding the wharf for parking. Um, I think that's great. Um, the, it it just makes a lot of sense. Also, all the bike parking that's um, being um, added, all that is great. And um, the more we can get people 
um, out onto that wharf um, without being in the car is is fantastic. Um, the upgraded parking kiosks, I think, I think that's a great uh, great thing. It's gonna, in my mind, it will decrease the congestion around um, getting in and out, um, and also the fact that it's moving more to the wharf. Um, it also provides us the opportunity to, or, or it decreases the opportunity for that traffic to be backing up into that roundabout, which I think is a, um, which is a great idea because I could see that being, um, being a problem. Um, increasing access to recreational activities, um, I think is a, it's a fantastic piece of this. I mean, you get the fishing, there's potential for fishing, there's, uh, um, kind of in ocean swimming activities, um, the, the ability to take a boat out to go whale watching, the biking, the running and the walking that, that can all happen on um, within this plan, um, I think are great benefits um, to, um, to the public. Um, and then um, I think embracing the public oriented activities on the wharf, I think is a, so we're, we're talking, we've been talking a lot about um, these these new buildings and um, and you know there's been discussion around you know creating a large box and that's what really Costco is for or whatever and so that that to me um, the landmark building to me is uh, is really this placeholder for this opportunity for all kinds of different activities and um, some of them can be um, actually built into the building and I think some of them um, can be just curated, you know, through, oh, you know, throughout the season or, you know, or whatever. It just, I mean, I think it just provides this opportunity for public gathering. And I think that's what all three of those new buildings uh, and new structures um, uh, are really providing is this place for, for the public to um, be on the wharf, but also gather at a, um, in a particular location and, and you know, for, uh, for whatever the event um, might be. And I think it's, I think that's important. I think that's an important piece uh, to this plan. Um, I think the improvement of the commercial storefronts um, is also uh, extremely important, um, especially when we're talking about <laughs> views. I mean, the, the whole idea to be in a restaurant and 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 you can't if you, if, we, if there's these blank walls that don't allow this view out, it just it doesn't make any sense. And the uh, and then in addition, you know we shouldn't be um, we shouldn't be putting the uh, the functional aspects of uh, of the buildings on the on the perimeter. So like, meaning like the, the walk-ins or the storage rooms or, you know, whatever, those should not be placed on that public side um, of the building. Um, so I, I think that, you know, this plan is, is really showing some, some great ideas, uh, especially, and in addition with the liner uses um, and getting these smaller um, businesses out on the, out on the wharf to, to break up some of the, you know, potential larger, pieces so you make it a little bit more affordable um, for these businesses to come in open up and you know make a go and have a go at it and you know maybe it's something that they would expand for you know take that take that concept and go to a larger um, building or, or into a larger space in the future um, I think it's um, I think it's a great a great idea um, so anyway with all of this I just I think that the, the that these are the key elements that um, that are within this plan are the key elements that are going to pro provide the bright future um, for the wharf as a, as a benefit, as a public benefit with the social, environmental, and economic strategies that um, that will, you know, for those that uh, will work, play, and gather um, on the wharf. So, um, so I'm excited. Thank you. Um, I have a number of comments. I want to start with a question. It kind of follows up on something Commissioner Spellman said. Uh, I wonder if uh, the environmental consultant could respond to the testimony we had regarding the nesting um, that was sort of critical of the analysis of the in the EIR. I wonder um, if 
we could get a response to that? Um, sure. Um, we addressed it both in the, this is with regards to the west side walkway. I think there was a good, with regards to the nesting and the biotic, uh, um, the biotic study that indicated that there would, that, you know, the walkways wouldn't prevent, wouldn't prevent nesting and the argument that it, they actually would and that there was no uh, evidence that the, the walkways uh, wouldn't prevent it. So I, I just, I wasn't okay. clear on the question, but. Okay. Um, so just to, to preface this, um, sometimes um, technical biological reports are prepared and appended to an EIR, and sometimes the biologists prepare the EIR section directly, and that's what we did in this case. So the person, first of all, we had um, Gary Kittleson and Brian Morey, local biologists who did the uh, nesting survey at the wharf, and then Dave Compton, who is a biologist with um, over 20 years experience at DDAC, um, wrote all of the impact sections, the uh, setting and the impact sections related to the bird nesting. And then we had another biologist from DDAC, Michael Henry, who prepared the uh, marine biology um, setting impact. And there were a couple others on um, some special issues. But with regards to the nesting, we did report, Dave um, Compton reported, that the lowered walkway indeed could affect nesting in that area. However, the thing to remember is that this is a wharf, it's a structure. They're also nesting in other areas in the region um, in greater numbers than that wharf. And the expansion, the expansion of these promenades is creating the same under the wharf conditions as currently exist. And there's no reason to um, think that birds wouldn't be able to use those areas. So based on, Dave is an um, ornithologist, that's his area of expertise, and he also reviewed this with Gary Kittleson. So they didn't think that that, because the offset with the East Promenade was actually creating more habitat in the sense that the morph is, create, is um, providing habitat and that it would not have an adverse effect on um, the ability of the birds to nest there. There would still need to be, you know, pre-construction nesting surveys. There's a full mitigation included on how that would be done and what would be done if the birds are found and where they're found and buffers and that kind of thing. Um, and then I think the other, there was another question that came up in the public comments that is addressed along with this in the final EIR. And that had to do with um, the boat landings. I think there was a comment that the boat landings might, and the activity associated with it might adversely affect the nesting. And uh, again, Dave looked at that, and there's already existing boat landings. There's five of them along the east side of the wharf. So there's already activity there. And more or less, the, the Small boat landing is consolidating what's already there in one location, and there's still plenty of open area along the wharf where there wouldn't be any landing. And um, the, the, the south landing is new, but again, it's, it's, together they represent a relatively small part of the whole wharf. So there's next, and also there's all, some existing activity there already. So for those reasons, they concluded that um, that would not have an adverse effect on the nesting. Can I, can I just add one more observation from the, the EIR? Um, on section, on page 4.2-9 regarding the nesting species, it notes that pigeon gallimots are cliffside cavity nesters in their native habitat. Uh, I would presume that in a, a cliffside habitat, there's not multiple ways of entry. They're typically approaching from one side. Just an observation. <laughs> one would think so. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Was, Does that answer uh, your question? Yeah, I did. Uh, I did. 
David, did you was, were you making a statement or a question? I wasn't quite sure the impact. No, it's just it's just my observation that you know currently they've got a very favorable multiple entry point, but in their native habitat and where they normally live, it would seem that they typically approach from one side, and that even with a restricted access on potentially the west side, their native behavior would probably work. But it's only my observation; it's not based on any science or. Well, I, but I think it's useful, uh, the, the uh, response from Ms. Strelo that talked about the biologists and their analysis do provide expert testimony and uh, would be considered, I think, substantial evidence that would um, document the, the findings in the EIR. So I, I kind of wanted to just get that on the record so it's clear. And let me say that. Overall, I'm a very strong supporter of the Wolf Master Plan. Um, maybe not as impatient as staff to see it move forward, but I've been waiting for it to happen for a number of years because I think it is a, a very important improvement, uh, not only in terms of the long-term uh, viability of the wharf, but also in terms of providing additional opportunities for members of the public to enjoy uh, the ocean and some of the wildlife that exists there. My concern with the landmark building is twofold. One is I don't really I think it's unnecessary, and I don't um, I don't I I, I, don't, I think it detracts from the wharf rather than adds to it. But a, a, even a bigger concern of mine is that uh, if it sort of follows from the comments that uh, Commissioner Dawson made. I think the EIR's analysis of the impact, the aesthetic impact of the proposed building, even at 40 feet, um, which is a 50 percent increase over the average height, would be considered a significant impact. And my concern is that to the extent that the plan is approved with uh, problems with the uh, adequacy of the EIR, it's subject to um, a lawsuit that could significantly delay it. Um, I don't uh, see the need for including the landmark building in the Wharf Master Plan at this time. As staff has said, it's probably not going to happen very quickly anyway. And there are so many other projects that need to be done, the walkways, the other buildings, the uh, wharf entrance, that um, there is, I don't think there's any need to include it at this point. If after those other projects are implemented and it seems like it would make sense to, you know, really provide some kind of a structure at the end of the wharf, it's not that difficult to come forward with a project and, a, in my view, and a, a, an amendment to the plan that will allow that to happen. So I just want to really uh, emphasize that my biggest concern with the, um, the proposed landmark building and why I think it needs to be eliminated from the plan at this time is that it will um, make the plan itself uh, and it's uh, vulnerable through uh, an inadequacy in the EIR. Saying that, I uh, support actually all the uh, recommendations of the Star Preservation Commission and would hope that in any motion to recommend approval of the master plan, it would include the recommendations from the Star Preservation uh, Commission. And you know, from my perspective, the 35-foot height limit was, uh, was sort of a, uh, a critical change. I did want to thank the staff for some of the changes that they, uh, particular changes they made um, to the master plan. Um, looking at page 15 of the staff report, where it deals with cruise ships, and the proposed new language eliminates um, the, the sort of less clear language of is not intended to serve as a, term, a terminus and just takes that out and says it will not serve as a terminus. I think Commissioner Spellman uh, uh, raised some concerns about, well, what would be allowed? The staff report or the staff presentation indicated the kinds of research vessels and, um, you know, whale watching and some of the abilities, but I think the, what I understood the major public concern was it's not going to be ocean, uh, it's not going to be cruise ships, 
And I think that that was made, uh, that change to on page 23 does make that clear, although um, on page 11, I think it would um, be useful to add the same language under section 3, paragraph 7, where it says construct a landing facility for docking at the Eastern Bayward End for science education, research, sport fishing, and whale watching, but take then add, but it will not serve as a terminus for ocean liners, cruise ships, or any tonnage not to provide, nor to provide mooring for extended periods. So I would suggest adding the, the language that staff recommends to that um, section of uh, uh, policies so that there would be internal consistency. Um, then, in terms of the entrance sign, I think um, the language that the staff came up with that takes out the specifics is really uh, good. I think it really does solve the problem in the language that did about having an attractive uh, entrance sign centrally located atop the parking gates, designed to be visible the distance while keeping with the character of the wall. Um, as developed is a very uh, desirable change. I would recommend, though, that the, that the drawing in the master plan uh, that shows a, a possible uh, gate, uh, which I think is on page, um, page 36, uh, it shows an 80-foot sign. I think that should be deleted from the plan. Um, the EIR uh, analysis um, would set the limits of what could be um, could be approved. It doesn't need to be in the plan. I think it just is going to be confusing to the public, misleading, uh, and to the extent that people don't trust um, what the council is likely to do, having it there in all its glory um, is going to make people unhappy. So I think it's. Um, it would be really desirable to, uh, and I would uh, hope that when, when we take action on this, we include a recommendation to just delete that uh, page with that, um, that drawing because I think it's, one, unnecessary, two, misleading, and in a way inconsistent with the proposed language that staff has added, which I think is, uh, you know, very desirable language. Beyond that, the only uh, recommendations I was going to make would, uh, would be to support the 35-foot height limit uh, for all the buildings. I think the wharf has a, you know, I, I walk on the beach, uh, the main beach and the Seabright Beach a lot, and there's a sort of character to the wharf that you, that you um, when you're walking in terms of just gives a certain impression of um, the, you know, what's going on there. And I, I think it gives the wolf a character that really is in keeping with the kind of community that we have. And limiting the height of the new buildings to 35 feet and eliminating the landmark building um, would be um, really be worthwhile changes to make in the uh, recommendations to the council on the map. So those are my, um, um, oh, yes, Commissioner Conway, did you have comments? Yes, I did. Thank you. Um, first of all, I um, thank, thank you all for your comments. I really, um, as always, appreciated all of them. Um, and I especially want to thank David for really um, making it uh, very clear, very complicated report. And I also want to thank uh, Mr. Bambachi um, for maintaining the work for us um, all these years under trying circumstances. Um, one thing that's really clear through this process is that Santa Cruz really loved this wharf. And um, uh, if we want to have a wharf, which is obvious we do, um, we need to have a plan. And uh, this, is, this is long overdue. Um, I know the city's been getting uh, pressure for a long time from um, agencies, especially Coastal, the Coastal Commission, um, urging adoption of a plan. Um, and uh, we need to have approved environmental documents and a master plan um, in order to get the kind of funding that we need to be able to um, support this plan. 
So there's a lot to love in this plan. Um, the year-round use, um, it, it gives us a chance for it really to be economically vibrant and what I would say is even economically viable. Um, I think that the balance between um, public open space and commercial space to allow us to keep this wharf is, is really important. It's a resilient plan. Um, I really appreciate the sensitivity to the historic use and also just how treasured this wharf is by our community um, historically. And as has been said by a number of people, um, the circulation and the safety, biking out there, walking out there, um, visiting the sea lions, boating, you know, around it, swimming around it. Um, it's just, it's a really important place. Um, I, uh, like Commissioner Nielsen, I am in favor of the landmark building. Um, I don't know that it'll get built, but I think that it, it's aspirational. I think that the potential uses out there um, could really be amazing. Um, and I, also, I thought 45 feet, I understand the difference and I understand the, um, I liked the, you know, the sort of deco references with some appurtenances. I thought they seemed kind of high also. Um, I'm not in favor um, of reducing it to 35 feet at that, this time. I haven't heard a compelling reason to um, set a limit that's less than the current zoning. Um, however, um, whatever building does come forward is going to receive and also certainly deserve intense public scrutiny. Um, does it fit in? Does it add to um, both the use and the appearance of the wharf? And I think um, that those things are important. Um, and uh, I also, maybe more than anything, the ability to um, adequately maintain this treasured resource is really the compelling overarching reason um, to support it. Um, Chair Schifrin uh, suggested that we should, uh, 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 or asked if, if, um, if there was someone gonna make a motion, which I'm certainly willing to make, um, if we would consider including the rec recommendations of the HPC. Um, I'd like to ask that they be um, put up for um, better review. We haven't had a lot of time with those. There was one of those that I think would be a real mistake to include. Only one stuck out with me. Um, and I believe that there was something about a building any bigger than, was it 3,000 square feet, um, should add uh, additional layers of bureaucracy. And that just seems way too small to be practical um, if I got that right. Um, and I feel um, if, if I did get that one right, my objection to it um, is that it is going to make it harder, more expensive, and far more time consuming um, to um, some of the vibrant businesses we're trying to open out there. Um, and again, I love so many of the ideas about use of the commercial space, especially the ones that, you know, it's built out, it can come in, it can come out. Um, thank you for putting that back up. Oops, sorry, yeah, the wrong slide. Is it the right one? <laughs> Did you get the right one on your end? Uh, I, I don't see it. Okay, hold on a sec. Um, and yeah, and, and they're kind of finalizing the, the minutes, so this is basically it, uh, paraphrasing, but getting the key elements of what they said. Well, in anything that we do tonight, we're going to be sending to council, so if some of the language is, is finalized, Okay, um, uh, I'm all right with letter A. I um, really strongly disagree with um, letter B. Um, I love um, letter C to encourage the development of a World History Museum and, and other interpretive materials. Um, and, um, and I guess I didn't notice that this is part of that. Of that. Um, I am not in favor of reducing the landmark building um, below the current zoning. Um, however, I'm also not, um, if, you know, to 35 feet. 
I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's helpful. I think it um, hamstrings a future project that I think is fairly likely to not go over 35 feet, but I, I'm not in favor of it. So I I think everybody has spoken um, so at I this point. I suggest the process for moving forward on this and that somebody make a motion to approve this. I was actually, a, I was just about, I was in the middle of doing that, Chair Schiffman. We could just ex express a, and then what we could do is people could make uh, motions mm -hmm. to amend and we could vote on the motions yeah. to amend. Yeah, I was going to, I was actually just trying to do that, uh, Chair Schiffman. Um, I was going to move the uh, staff recommendation and include uh, two of the recommendations uh, from the historic research, the um, preservation commission. Sorry, I got into county language for a minute, and I don't see him again. I believe it was uh, letter. Thanks for putting it back up, um, including um, the uh, first and third um, letter A and letter C from the HPC recommendations. That would be my motion. Is there a second that? I think that motion. Okay. Uh, you want to take that down so we can sort of see each other? Uh, is there anyone who would make a motion? Oh, yes, uh, Commissioner Dawson. Is this the time to make an amendment to that motion? Amend Need a motion second. Out. We got a second. A second that. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, it's been motion and seconded to approve the F recommendation with uh, um, recommendations A and C from the Star Preservation Commission. Commissioner Dawson, did you want to make an amended, uh, suggest an amended motion? Yeah, I would like to amend that motion uh, to remove the two sections that. Um, uh, on page 11 and page 12 that talk about constructing a new landmark building. I'd like to remove both of those sections and also add the HPC uh, recommendation letter D for 35 foot limit to all building heights. Could we separate those, um, those two issues? Um, sure. have motion on idea to delete the landmark building from the master plan? Is that your, the intention of the motion? Sure. Um, is there somebody who would second that motion? Second that. Commissioner Maxwell, um, again, I, I think that not having it in the master plan at this time um, will make it a stronger plan legally and given the public opposition to that uh, to that building, and so um, I'm I'm also in support. I'm in support of the motion. Um, Commissioner Spellman, did you want to speak to the motion? The the motion to yes, amend? please. Um, no, I'm not in support of eliminating it from the plan. Um, again, I think this is a. It's an opportunity. Yes, it's a big footprint on the current plan, but all we're doing is allowing for a potential project there in the future. Mm -hmm. What it is and what the use of it is and the scale of it, um, I think it would be a big mistake to just wipe it out of the plan. So I won't be in support of that point. And like what, Rosso, we'll stay on that point, yeah. I didn't hear the last thing you said. I'm sorry. No, I was going to comment on the height, but I, we'll wait for that to come up again. Okay. Commissioner Greenberg? You're still muted. I'll get the hang of this. Um, I would agree with Commissioner Solomon on this. I think that there could, that we're creating the opportunity, I think is a good way of thinking about it. And I really um, hear the concern about the experience of the wharf being one that you're out on the ocean like on a boat. I think there are ways of designing this building, um, both the siting of it and the building itself that could maintain potentially some of that feeling. I'm thinking of like the bow of a ship, you know, that you could come around and there could be seating areas. 
you know, in front of that building. The building itself could have more kind of sight lines. I, you know, I'm not an architect, but I could imagine that there are ways of having it be more permeable. I also like the idea that while the other spaces are mainly, you know, purely commercial, it could be more of a public space potentially with more opportunity for gathering. I like the idea potentially of there being a fish market there, um, a sustainable, you know, fish market. And that's not in, the, in, in anything I was reading, but I know that fish markets have been eliminated from a lot of cities around the world um, and are very popular. And we are a, you know, have a, have a fish, fishing industry there. So I think that in addition to which there could be other public uses of that space and it could be covered, so it could be, you know, year-round. So I think um, that there's a lot of opportunity for that building and that if we can preserve that potential while maintaining some of these concerns about the aesthetics of it, the experience of it, um, that we could, you know, balance, balance these, these competing concerns. I, I support uh, the, you know, preservation of that in the plan. Thank you. Are there other commissioner comments? So this is a motion to amend the plan by deleting the, um, the landmark building at this time. Um, can we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Conway? No. Spellman? No. Dawson? Yes. Nielsen? No. Greenberg? No. Maxwell? Um, you are muted, uh, Commissioner Maxwell. Yes. Schifrin? Yes. The motion fails four to three. Um, did you want to make your uh, other motion to amend to limit the uh, height of buildings to 35? Commissioner Dawson? Sure. So are you making a motion? Why don't you say I am. It? I'm making a motion to include the HPC uh, recommendation letter D to have um, the motion align with that recommendation for 35 foot height limit for all the buildings. Is there a second? A second to the motion. I thought I saw a hand up. Well, I'm going to second it for discussion. Um, I think it's um, again important to keep the scale of the um, of the buildings on the wharf <clears throat> so that they are con consistent and there's a you know the, the character of the wharf is uh, maintained. Increasing the building uh, height by 50 percent. Uh, is not going to is not in my mind going to do that. I think it creates a significant impact on the CEQA uh, for the plan, and I think it's, it will uh, make a major change here. Or uh, does anybody else want to speak to this motion, Commissioner Nielsen? Uh, my my um, sorry, am I okay? Um, I, I, I disagree with that. I, I don't. I, I haven't heard anything tonight, any testimony from um, from Stephanie um, Strilo about the fact that um, the height going, you know, fr from the average height of 27 feet up to 40 feet is uh, a significant impact. Um, the significant impact is based off of uh, scenic, the scenic view, and um, I don't see that this, you know, the the you know, restricting this height um, down to 35 feet is going to make um, is going to make a change. And the the other thing is that I, I feel strongly about the fact that certain buildings need to have a uh, a hierarchy um, on that wharf. Um, and these particular um, proposed buildings um, would fall into that category, in my opinion. And um, and so I think. Just setting a blanket height for all buildings on the wharf, I think, is a is a bad strategy, um, especially you know it, as uh, as such a development happens along that wharf um, and those and those commercial buildings get up to that 35 foot height. Um, I think you know I think it's going to be a missed opportunity um, by just 
setting all building heights at 35 feet. Doing, uh, Commissioner Spellman? Yeah, I would, I would uh, sort of echo those comments as well. I think keeping it to the current zoning standard and reducing it from 45 to 40, as, as staff has recommended, is appropriate here. I think the reality of building on that wharf is going to be a huge challenge to putting large buildings on it. So I don't see all of a sudden the proposed commercial area in this master plan being built out to 40 feet. Um, so again, I think it's a parameter. It's a, it's a guideline per se that's in play. And I think having some flexibility, which I believe probably will never be reached is, is, is needs to be in there at this point. And, you know, everything will be going through a very scrutinized process, including, you know, coastal development permit, et cetera. So there's not going to be, uh, you know, a rush to develop out here. Well, I agree that there won't be a rush, but as we see with the down development in the downtown, if the plan allows it, that's what's recommended. Um, so uh, is there any other comments from commissioners? Let's have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Conway. But could you um, state exactly how this motion reads? I believe it says it's to reduce from 40 to 35. It's to add the HPC recommendation um, to, to have a 35 okay, foot height limit. Sure clear. And I'll say no. Spellman? No. Dawson? Yes. Nielsen? No. Greenberg? No. Maxwell? No. Griffin? Aye. Uh, the motion fails five to two. Yes. Yes. So I would ask, um, I suggested a change in the policy uh, under Section 3, the policies to make it clear that to provide the same language um, that's in the, uh, that staff has recommended later in the, uh, later in the uh, plan in that section as well. Does, would staff have any uh, uh, objection to doing that? David? Uh, you're talking about the, the cruise ship language, moving it up in the... Yeah, I don't think staff would have any, any um, objection to that. Um, I, would, I would ask one clarifying question based upon uh, Commissioner Spellman's uh, discussion about clarifying what types of boats uh, would go there. Um, and I think later on in the, in the master plan, there's some pretty good clarity about you know, whale watches, dinner cruises, sunsets, those, that type of stuff. Uh, but we've had some discussion about fishing boats, commercial fishing boats, and that is not currently in the plan. Uh, so if that's something you would want to consider putting in the plan or, or clarifying, um, I might suggest you include that in your, your, your motion. So why don't we separate those two issues? Um, so you're saying you don't have a problem putting the language that's later in the plan earlier in the plan? You know, I think it would be very consistent with our intent not to have uh, really our, our commitment not to have uh, cruise ships, you know, overnight ocean liner type vessels at the wharf. So would the maker of the motion, the seconder, uh, accept that as a friendly amendment? I wanted to hear, um, John, did you have a, a comment you wanted to make about the fishing boats? Yeah, I, I just I just wanted to add some clarity about about the tough landing is just to kind of calm some jitters. Um, because we're a, a open ocean kind of a landing rather than a, a behind a breakwater, um, you need to overbuild a landing somewhat to so it's not a maintenance project all the time. In other words, you build it to, to accept a larger vessel than what you anticipate, uh, just just so that it, it doesn't put a lot of stress on the wharf, it doesn't put a lot of stress on, on, on the landing. Uh, you just you just build it to a standard that you know you're not going to get to. 
the 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 boat the largest boat that we thought of when when we designed when we looked at the design concept for that landing was the the tall ships that come in the the Lady Washington and and uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, museum like uh -huh. Lion Feet uh, those uh -huh. are two because they have an ocean uh, uh -huh. science program. Okay, so I, thank you for a, that. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I'm, the, it's acceptable to me. Is it acceptable to the seconder? Yes. Okay, so the motion would include that change. Now, do you want to add fishing boats to the, um, to the list of, in section three it says, uh, section three on page 11, uh, actually sec, under section three it says, construct a landing facility for the docking at the Eastern Bayward End for science, education, research, sports, fishing, and whale watching. Did um, the, David suggested maybe adding commercial fishing? Is that something that uh, the maker of the motion in the second would like to add? You know, um, I have a little bit of a concern. I like the idea that a commercial fishing boat could land and um, you know, participate in the sort of economy of the wharf in that way. But it also feels like we've got our, our fishing boat uh, infrastructure, if you will, um, at the harbor. And I feel like it's kind of a big thing to, to throw in. Um, I guess I'd like to say, does the language as it's included here in the general plan, would it preclude a fishing boat if it's not included in the language of the adopted master plan? Um, is there a finding that could be made? Because it seems to me that some further analysis than throwing, kind of throwing it in, I see advantages to it, but I'm a little concerned about it. Um, yeah, Stephanie, it, really might, oh, it looks like Commissioner Nielsen has a comment as well. Well, I just have I just have a quick question. I mean, is it do we do we need to include every possible boat yeah. that's going to land here, or can we just prohibit a certain type or certain types of boats so that we're not we're not you know stuck with this language that says only these boats can yeah. come here? I think we I think that the it, from what I'm hearing and what I understand from the public is that there's there's very specific things that they don't want. So let's yeah. let's 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 prohibit those things rather than trying to list off every possible thing that's going to show up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, as, yeah as, as, uh, Commissioner Conway said, it wouldn't preclude commercial fishing boats, but we wouldn't be, you know, kind of prescribing that they would be coming. Um, and are you concerned Commissioner Conway that there could be some issue with the harbor in some fashion? Well, um, uh, just that um, I just I just think that it's something that we'd want to be thoughtful about, and maybe it's mm -hmm. not a big deal. Um, right. It sounded like staff feels like it's okay to say a fishing boat could tie up, um, you know, sell some fish, um, and you know, move on. They're not going to birth there, obviously. Um, so right. maybe it's not a concern. Um, okay. And yeah. Okay. Okay. It's sounding like this is not a. Uh, it isn't necessary to add this uh, additional language, and it might be confusing, or it might uh, need some more study to make it a, to actually specify that it's going to be there. Yeah. So the final uh, request that I would make, and I guess I'm asking staff about taking out that, that illustration from the plan that shows the entrance as. Uh, inconsistent with uh, uh, additional language that was, um, I think, uh, I've supported that staff uh, rec is now recommending. I, I think, you know, personally, I think it, it's good to have some examples of what uh, it could be. Um, I understand the, the target that it potentially has become. Um, my suggestion would be maybe to take out the dimensions and add more examples um, so that it's not the dominant image, but it's more uh, a, a collage of different types of entry signage um, to start the conversation. Um, but if it, if it needs to go, and that's the commission. Happy with that. 
Um, so mm -hmm. would that could that be a recommendation that uh, illustration in the um, in the master plan take out the dimensions and provide other alternatives? Is that acceptable to the maker of the motion? And the second, yes. I, um, um, I think it might be, but I have a question. I I don't think designs just get you know cranked out super quickly. Is it would um, having further uh, sort of sketches of design slow the process down. Um, I, I get, I agree with the point of having examples to know what we're thinking about, but I think, you know, those designers work long and hard. It doesn't just happen quickly. Well, my yeah, question, what do you, that could be a that, that was my question, Steph. If that was approved, yeah, it, was, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have to, have to be there in the, well, at the time okay. it's approved. That goes the, um, well, okay. the, the designer did provide a couple of different uh, examples. Um, so you saw sort oh. of the bluish sign um, in one of the, the renderings uh, for the aesthetics. Um, but if, we, if you were open to it, we could include a couple of those and then just some inspirational images from other places um, sure. that, you know, were more artsy or whatnot. Mm -hmm. so I like that. That's acceptable to the maker of the acceptable. Acceptable to the second? Yeah. Yes. Okay, does anybody, uh, uh, do any of the commissioners have any other amendments they would like to make to the motion on the floor? I, I Yes, Commissioner Spellman. I would like to somehow attempt to describe an amendment that would encourage breaking up the massing of the commercial buildings so that we we get away from just the long street of continuous facade. I don't want to limit it per se, but I think I would encourage so that folks looking at this would at least understand that there was some concern and potential there to um, you know, create a different experience if we were able to break that up. I think my, my motion would be to, or my amendment would be to encourage breaking the long run of commercial buildings to have connections to the um, west side of the of the wharf as you as you would travel down uh, the commercial section. So um, that could be potentially put in under the design standards for building form. Uh, it would be adding a sentence. Uh, what it says now is uh, for inline commercial establishments along the western edge of the wharf, buildings are encouraged to balance individual identity within a collective form that's simple, straightforward, and appropriate to maritime setting. Um, uh, breaking up of the, uh, of the mass of buildings should be encouraged. Does that capture what you want to say? I think it could be more purposeful. I'm not asking to, you know, have a building and then not a building. I think it could be one or two, right? I, I mean, I, it's, I'm leaving it open-ended specifically, but um, that's it. I mean, it's a hard one to try and wrap your thought around. Commissioner Nielsen, did you have suggested language that you could propose? Well, I, I'm not well. I'm not sure if I do yet, but I, I think my I would want to know from John what his thoughts are on this before we mm -hmm. start making those changes because there could be specific things that we're not considering. May I speak to that? Yes. Yeah. Please. Um, there's there's kind of a practical consideration in that long row of buildings, and that it serves as a windbreak during inclement weather. Uh, the master plan actually looks at, at kind of putting an awning out over part of the sidewalk. Um, and, and this is just kind of looking at the sustainability of, of the wharf and, and trying to um, weatherize some of the commerce out there a little bit. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not completely opposed to the idea of no spaces in those buildings at all, but they do serve a practical purpose. Uh, and keeping and keeping the weather down and giving people a place to walk out there when it's not great, and you, and you and also please consider that you would have the west walkway, 
and that the master plan does call for uh, see-through, uh, seeing through the buildings. It, it, it does make a lot of specifics about that. So your so your view was, is not going to be this block of buildings the way it is now. Thank okay. you. I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm I'm fine removing my amendment. I'm good with uh, okay. the way we have it. Are there any other amendments uh, commissioners would want to make to the motion on the floor? So, oh, am I going to be able to remember them? Um, the clerk has the motion. Yes. Okay. Does any member of the commission want the motion repeated? Or do does they feel they understand it? Okay. Assuming they do, let's have a roll call vote. Commissioner Conway? Aye. Selman? Aye. Dawson? No. Nielsen? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Schifrin? Aye. The motion passes six to one. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, can we uh, move right along with the committee. Well, since we're all at home, <clears throat> I assume people can take a break when they need to. Um, Chair? I want to thank staff very much for uh, their presentation. Uh, I want to thank the members of the public for testimony, uh, for testifying. And uh, let's move on to item uh, number three, which is an amendment to Title 24 to amend the uh, uh, chapter 2416, the inclusionary housing requirements, and I'm not going to read the whole thing that's on our agenda. Um, Mr. Greenberg, did you have something you wanted to say? No, I was just waving to the folks who are leaving. Um, oh, Chair okay. Schifrin, uh, this is the clerk. We may want to preemptively uh, entertain a motion to extend the meeting to ex adjourn at a time certain because it's 20 to 11 and you're supposed to adjourn at 11 with that absent that motion uh, let me just ask how long the staff report this has been before us before um, uh, if we could have us I'm not sure how much uh, well uh, are the members of the public who are waiting to speak on this there are three members of the public none of which have uh, raised their hands at this point, but we haven't asked for public comment. And maybe to be on the safe side, why not uh, somebody make a motion to extend, if necessary, the meeting till 1130? Uh, I'll make that motion to extend the meeting till 1130. Is there a second? I'll second it. Um, is there any need for discussion? Is there any? Uh, I don't know if we need a roll call vote or not. So, um, does anybody vote? Would anybody vote no? Okay, so I'll say the motion passes. Hopefully, we won't be here that long. Um, and let's ask for a staff report on item number three. One. All right. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Can you can everyone hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, I'm Jessica DeWitt. I'm with the Housing Division at the City. Um, what you see before you. There we go. Uh, what you see before you is an updated staff recommendation to amend the inclusionary inclusionary ordinance based on direction from the seven, September 17th Planning Commission meeting. I'll go into more detail on these updates in a minute, but first I wanna walk you through the steps taken after the September 17th Planning Commission meeting. We compared the latest Housing Authority payment standard rents with the state HED moderate income rents and confirmed that there is roughly a $200 to $500 rent difference between the two rent tables, the rents in the two rent tables, 
And while the studio one and two bedroom unit rents are higher for the modern income rent, the three bedroom payment standard rent is higher. So after reaching out for feedback from the housing authority and the development community, we met with the housing subcommittee to come up with the following updates to further encourage renting to tenant-based subsidy holders. Uh, in the definition section, we wanted to clarify how moderate income rent is calculated. This de definition is based on the state standard formula. Then based on how the updates flow through the other amended sections, it seemed clearer to define the payment standard unit rent for that 5% of the inclusionary units that must be offered to tenant-based subsidy holders first. And if no one is available, then the rent will be either the payment standard rent or the moderate income rent, whichever is lower. So while the tenant-based subsidy holder definition has not changed since we last met, we did add a definition for a payment standard unit for further clarification. Uh, section 7 hasn't changed since we last met. Then in Section 9, uh, nothing has changed except for redefining these units as payment standard units. And to reiterate, these units will be always rented to available subsidy holders first. And then as one becomes vacant, it will go through the exact same process with the Housing Authority. Okay, then in Section 9C, this describes the process for determining the payment standard rent for a subsidy holder versus a non-subsidy holder. And again, nothing has changed in this section other than that. And finally, in the, the, then the, rest, the concepts of the rest of Section 9 haven't changed except for encouraging owners to free up low-income units for low-income households by placing subsidy holders in payment standard units when one becomes available. All right, so to wrap up, here's the staff recommendation being presented before you tonight. Um, I'd like to open it up to the subcommittee members to see if they'd like to speak and then respond to any questions. Uh, Commissioner Conway, I know you're the chair of the subcommittee. I don't know if you'd like to speak first. Um, well, I'd like to thank staff and also the committee members. Obviously, this has been a really bumpy time to try to develop um, you know, policy, and um, I really appreciate the time that, that both staff um, and commissioners uh, put into it. Um, you know, this was, this additional 5% is um, really um, meant to be a compromise between continuing to um, deed restrict as many units um, as we can and also providing um, um, a, a little bit of room that may or may not make projects more viable. Um, but I think it was an honest attempt um, uh, to do that, appreciated everybody's feedback. Um, I, as I've stated before, and I'll state it again, um, the uh, goal of constructing housing is one of the really important purposes. I don't believe we undertook this with the thoughtfulness that it merits. Um, but I really appreciate where we landed in terms of, um, you know, trying trying to seek a compromise. So thanks to everybody. That's all I have to say. Do other members of the subcommittee want to um, say, say anything? Uh, Commissioner uh, Spellman? Yeah, I, j just quickly, I mean, I, I agree with uh, what Julie said there. Uh, I do think it was a compromise. I do think at the end of the day, the language that we have put into this ordinance is the right language and the fair language to encourage uh, the use of the vouchers and to, you know, protect, I think, moving forward, how that would be used. So I'm, I'm, I'm in support of this recommendation. Uh, could I ask uh, Jessica to, to give us back the, uh, maybe close the shared screen so I can see what other commissioners, I can only see a few commissioners. Okay, Commissioner Greenberg, did you want to add anything? You were the other member of the subcommittee. Yeah, um, I just wanted to, um, you know, voice my appreciation to subcommittee and the staff for their help with this. Um, and to Commissioner Dawson 
who brought this to our attention um, and the deliberation that we had that helped us to kind of recognize that it could be unclear, you know, the, that it wasn't our intention to create any kind of, uh, you know, incentive, let's say, for um, the people, you know, for, for uh, landlords not to find Section 8 tenants. And so I think this really strengthens um, the ordinance in a really important way, given that there wasn't really language in the ordinance previously because of, you know, when it was put into practice um, at a time when moderate income tenants were not anticipated to be covered by the ordinance in the, in the same way. And so there, weren't, there wasn't a specification for a rental level. But I think just clarifying the ordinance um, is really helpful and will really strengthen it and ensure that either Section 8 uh, tenants will be, you know, that there won't be as much of, it, of an incentive not to rent into Section 8 tenants. Um, and, we, and, and also the importance of having predictability um, in terms of developers, you know, going to lenders and so forth will also be maintained because of the kind of stipulation of the, of the similar um, level um, to Section 8 tenants. So I appreciated all the deliberations and thoughtfulness that went into this. It's not perfect. Um, inclusionary ordinances never are, and they can only do so much. Um, but I do think that we strengthened it in an important way. Uh, and so I appreciate you know, everyone's participation in this. Thank you. Thank you. Do other commissioners have questions before I open it up to the public? Seeing none, um, are there members of the public who would like to speak on this item? If so, Please give us your name, and you have up to three minutes. But first, you have to press star nine so you can get into the queue. There's one person, but they haven't um, indicated that they'd like to speak at this time. This is a public hearing, so anybody who wants to speak, um, this is the time to do it. Okay, we don't, uh, still no one? Nope. Close the public hearing and bring it back to the uh, co uh, commission. Let me just say how much I appreciate the work of the subcommittee and uh, uh, the staff here. Um, I think the, the proposed uh, amendment really um, goes as about as far as it could to try to uh, uh, attain the objectives that were set for it. So, um, you know, I was not particularly happy to have it sent back to the committee. And I appreciate the fact that the work was done quickly um, and got back here and that if the ordinance is, um, uh, the proposed ordinance is better than uh, what, what. So other commissioners have uh, comments. Uh, Commissioner Dawson. Uh, I just would like to um, echo those uh, thanks to everyone. This was a long road, and I just want to thank everybody for working so hard. It really is complicated, and but I really feel that the work you have all have done, and also just the, the conversations among us as commissioners throughout this process, has really resulted in a very um, I think a, a very impactful ordinance that is going to do what it is intended to do. So um, I don't know if there's further discussion, but if there isn't, I'd like to make a motion um, to support the ordinance. Is there a second? I'll second it. <clears throat> so there's a motion uh, and a second to approve the staff recommendation and recommend the amended ordinance to the city council. That that reflect what the motion was? Yes. And is there any further discussion on it? Seeing one, uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Conway? You're muted, you, uh, Commissioner Conway. Aye. Spellman? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Chair Schiffrin? Aye. Uh, again, thanks. Thanks. 
me and the staff. Is there any information? Good afternoon or evening. It's definitely evening now. Say <laughs> <laughs> <Good> night. <laughs> yeah, good night, Commissioner. Um, I'll make this quick because it is late. Uh, um, at your upcoming meeting, you've got one item uh, that is on um, 11-5. Uh, it is a single-family house on Carbonera that will be coming before you, and I think that came before you before and has since gone through some additional environmental review and will be back in front of you on 11-5. That's the only thing we have scheduled so far. And then um, I, um, we are targeting um, later in November to have some of the um, uh, objective standards work come to you. We're, we're pushing to get it there. It may uh, move to the first meeting on December 3rd, um, but hopefully we'll have that first check-in with the test fits and the outreach strategy on 11-19, um, along with the housing matters item on Coral Street. Um, and then um, finally, um, we had five items this week um, from planning um, at the commission. I'll run through them quickly. Um, the zoning ordinance cleanup and parking um, items that you recommended at your previous meeting, uh, the first reading was approved at council um, this week. Um, the beekeeping ordinance that you um, recommended approval of um, in August, um, that was continued when it went to council because of the fires. Um, some members of the beekeeping community were not able to make the meeting on August 25th. We continued it. That was approved. Um, they made a couple of tweaks um, very briefly. Instead of a uh, three-foot setback um, from the property line, they said uh, from the front property line, they said a 10-foot setback from the right-of-way, not from the property line. So kind of split the baby there, kind of a, a middle ground. So if the pedestrian, if there's no curb gutter and sidewalk, it'd be 10 feet from the, sorry, if there's no sidewalk, it'd be 10 feet from the curb back, um, just to provide separation there. And they also actually made it a little bit easier for um, the rear yard by only allowing or requiring one of four um, criteria to be met. Um, then um, the, there was a, a general plan um, amendment and rezoning consideration for 101 Felix that the council expressed, uh, adopted a resolution expressing non-support for um, that um, if the developer chooses to move forward, having received that, um, that indication of non-support uh, from the council, it would come before you, but we did bring it in front of the council to get an early read and uh, that was the, the council's uh, position on that. And finally, um, we got a, um, a uh, clearance from the council to apply for a, uh, re a REAP grant. It's a regional early action program um, grant. It's a guaranteed grant, and that would um, provide $300,000 towards an expansion of the downtown plan area. And so, we indicated that we would go back to council and give them a heads up on the outreach. You know, we probably won't be starting this for some months, um, you know, probably in the February timeframe at the earliest going back to council, but we would want to do outreach um, and, uh, and figure out what those boundaries would be um, as one of the first steps. And uh, council asked that we report back to them before we commence that outreach. So um, lots of things happening, and uh, you guys know about many of them because they're on your plates as well. And so thank you all for the work. Just wanted to report on um, some of those actions as they've moved forward. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Okay, we'll move on to subcommittee advisory body oral reports. Um, I don't have one from the resilience study. Um, we had one. Is there anything else from the housing subcommittee? You know, I could just check in and just note that um, one of the really pressing issues when uh, the increasing the inclusionary percentage went forward um, was um, real concern on the part of the school district. Um, and they, they do continue to be very concerned, but of course um, COVID has thrown them 
um, you might say, off their game as much as anybody. Um, so I appreciate staff's efforts to continue to um, act as a liaison with the information that we've been seeking. Um, and we do expect to. We have two additional meetings scheduled, um, at which point we expect our, our work to conclude as this subcommittee. That's it. Could I just ask if the subcommittee is looking at uh, uh, considering an option that would uh, provide uh, a separate standard for public agencies that are uh, constructing housing for their own employees? Um, we are, yeah. Um, and I know that we're, we're not agendized more than an update, um, but I, I think it's fair to say that as part of our update, we're looking at different funding opportunities that are available to employer-sponsored housing being undertaken by public serving agencies um, as part of a broad discussion. So we are certainly looking at funding opportunities and their requirements. Okay. Um, any items to refer to future agendas by the commissioners? Yes, I, I think. Uh, well, yeah, I was just thinking based on the conversation that we that we were having earlier um, regarding uh, commissioners communicating with commissioners via emails, letters, or you know whatever it might be. I think we. I think that should be something we discuss um, on a future agenda. Okay, the, so it would be an item to talk about the Brown Act requirements for. Uh, commission uh, communications with commissioners e and the public, I would say. E yeah, I mean, I, yeah, uh, specifically regarding, <clears throat> I guess, providing of commissioners um, uh, voicing opinion about um, items to come before the commission prior to that item happening. Well, I would add that's fine, but I think I, from my perspective, it's not just prior to, but even at the meeting. Um, I've been told I can't even uh, submit something to staff and have it added to public correspondence that commissioners would see as part of the agenda material. So I guess well, that But that would be prior to meeting, right? That right. would be prior to the to the meeting. So, I mean, if that's, if, the, if there's some intention to, to have that, I, I just think there needs to be con some uh, discussion around that because it's, um, I'm, I'm a little concerned about um, that becoming a, um, a, uh, a thing, you know. I, I think we need to talk, I think we have to talk about it and understand exactly what the limits are. Okay, is that okay with the planning director? It makes sense to me. Sure, if it's uh, of interest to the commission, we're happy to talk about that um, and um, bring the city attorney in for that conversation. Um, if the commissioners are interested, I, I can say that, um, you know, we, we haven't been going down that route um, for allowing those communications earlier, um, uh, but we, we did make that exception given that the item was continued. Um, Nevertheless, you know, there, there are some intricacies, as I alluded to before, and so if, if the commission desires to have an in-depth conversation about it, I'm sure we can uh, spend a decent chunk of time talking through it and um, would, be, would be happy to work with you all on that. That would be great. Okay. Um... Is, is that something I, I'm, I'm hearing from a couple I see? Commissioner Nielsen and Chair Schifrin are interested. Is that is that something that others would be interested in? I'm seeing yes. I'm seeing nodding heads. Okay, great. Because um, yeah, it, it it will take a, a little bit of work, um, and so um, uh, we will um, work on getting that on a future agenda. It'll probably be um, you know probably like the first meeting in December, but um, we'll we'll keep you posted on it. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, if there are no other items to refer, uh, we're adjourned. Thank you all very much. It's only 1101. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Good night, everybody. everybody. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you.
Goodbye.